Good evening. Calling to order the regular scheduled meeting of the El Segundo City Council, Tuesday, November 21st. Please stand. Pastor Lee Carlisle from the United Methodist Church will give our invocation, and Council Member Brand will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Good evening. I invite you to join me in prayer. Gracious God, as we look toward this year's Thanksgiving celebration, we are mindful of all the blessings that we have received. We give you thanks for family and friends, for the beauty of nature, for our work and play, and especially this night for the city which we call home. We ask your blessing on this meeting and give thanks for all those who have made it possible with their good work. We also give thanks for those who will give up their holiday to give aid and protection our police force and firefighters and play your blessing on them. And finally, we pray for those who lead our city's government, for Mayor Fuentes, for Mayor Pro Tem Boyles, and for Council Members Brand, Dugan, and Pertstuck. May they be given energy, wisdom, and guidance. And may everyone here this night work together for the common good of the city. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Carlisle. This evening we have some presentations. The first is the Treasury Department Quarterly Investment Portfolio Report. I see our City Treasurer, Krista Binder. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and City Council members. Krista Binder, City Treasurer. Tonight, I'd like to present to you the investment portfolio report ending for the period of September 7, 2017. So as you can see, our portfolio is broken down between short term or the liquidity portion and the longer term, um, sort of the reserve portion of the portfolio. Um, our, I'd like to point out our effective yields across the top there are meeting or exceeding our benchmark. So that's one of the performance measures we use. We always want to make sure we're sort of in line with those targets. And so you can see that we are. Um, and we continue to remain in compliance with our investment policy for all of the asset classes that we invest in. Um, this is a further breakdown of our corporate securities uh, that require we maintain an A rating or above on those. So you can see that all of those securities are within the uh, approved ratings. Um, this is a slide that tracks our continuing education. So we are very committed to attending conferences and seminars to keep current in best practices, not only in uh, investing, but in treasury as well. Um, this is our portfolio asset allocation. So this shows our diversification by security type, um, where you can talk the different types of the local agency investment fund, the senior housing, the life for the airport residential sound installation program, collateralized bank deposits through Plaza Bank, um, our, our negotiable certificates of deposit, our agency securities, and then our corporate bonds, and as well as our cash and bank. Um, I've, I've talked about this before. Um, we want to ladder out what I call the sort of the longer end of the portfolio between one and four to five years. So you can see we're, we're improving in that area and we're beginning to see more of that ladder which is what i like to see and this is the yield curve which doesn't seem to do too much <laughs> so um interestingly enough the shorter end or the one day portion of the yield curve or the is actually gone up more significantly than the longer end of the yield curve the next slide will sort of demonstrate that so you can see, if you look at the one month, if you go back to December 31st, you've got a, a greater rise in the rates than if you look at the five year, which is about, I think the five year went up about 13 basis points. So what that tells us is the yield curve is flattening. So when we look to, to seek out investment opportunities, we look shorter. We look to where those gains can be realized more equitably. 
Um, and when you do that in the shorter term, the money rolls over quicker, so then you can reinvest at a higher rate in the future. So now I'm going to turn over the presentation to Dino Marsochi, our Deputy Treasurer, too. Thank you. Uh, so looking at the cash flow, as we've done in the past, one thing that stands out this year, this July, the disbursements you can see are significantly higher than receipts and significantly higher than uh, disbursements throughout the year. And the big reason for that was approximately $7 million for the CalPERS uh, unfunded accrued liability that we paid. And then also about $1.9 million for our annual insurance payment. And you can see the change in cash portion, how it just went down quite a bit there. So the current activity, um, between July and September, we purchased a variety of different investments, including corporate bonds, Supra, and CDs, and government agencies. So we picked up nine uh, investments for $3.1 million and had about eight investments for just about $3 million mature. Since September, we've actually been quite busy. We've purchased 14 investments for $5.2 million, and we've had seven investments for $3.6 million mature. And one of the things we've had with that, you can see the net change for on the invested uh, versus matured securities for fiscal year 17 is 43 basis points, so almost half a percent. But if you look at the ones this year since we've started, uh, picking up the two and three years, as Krista talked about, we're up almost 1%, 0.894. So the purchases we've made so far are 1.945%. So we're starting to take advantage of that increase in the two to three year yield. Uh, net change in investments for last year, we invested $7 million more than what matured. And so far this year, we've invested $1.5 million more than what has matured. And as we've said in the past, we continue to actively manage the bank balances to maximize um, interest income. And here's a new slide showing how that works. And what we did, I included the, just the past quarter here. But you can see the, the bal bank balance, and then the second line is what we would have needed to have zero bank fees. Um, but the LAFE rate, you can see, is much higher than the earnings credit rate, which is like three lines from the bottom. So, so far, year to date, we've made about $8,000 more in interest income o over the fees that we would have been charged, or that we are being charged by the bank. And we're running the bank even tighter now, so I expect this amount to continue or to increase going forward. Uh, economic indicators, uh, GDP is doing very well. Uh, Q3 was at 3%. Uh, following 3.1 in Q2 and uh, 1.4 in Q1. So they're estimating about 2.5% for year-end, but the projections here show it being a little bit lower going forward, but we'll, we'll see what happens with tax reform and other um, items coming up. And then unemployment, of course, has continued to be very low. And inflation is picking up, so... Inflation is up around uh, just over 2% recently. So that's something the Federal Reserve looks at in raising their rates. And you can see the current rate here on the left, about you know, 1 to 1.25%. Uh, there's a very high probability that they will raise a quarter percent in December and maybe three times next year, um, looking to settle somewhere around 25 to 3% in the long term. And I don't know if anyone has questions. I had that one uh, super bond for $500,000 on the previous slide. Mm -hmm. What's the definition of a super bond? What, what you wanna? level does it need to attain to be classified as such? Um, a super national <coughs> bond is basically a funding entity that is domiciled basically within the United States, but that infuses capital in sort of underperforming countries. So they'll do big infrastructure projects. So it's a financing mechanism. Um, so that 
you know, they'll build a transportation hub in a, you know, in a more impoverished area. So it's just a different classification, but it, they, they're treated like um, uh, U.S. agency bonds, like Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, like that. Oh, um, investment size, it just depends on what we're looking to invest in. We, we typically target about a half a million or above when we look for agencies and others. The CDs we purchase uh, at 245000 because then they're FDIC insured. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Thank you, Krista. Thank you, Dino. Appreciate it. Okay, our next presentation is the Emergency Management Strategic Plan. And I see our Emergency Manager, Randall Collins. City, we will stop. Thanks. As a city, we will establish a program of emergency management that will prepare its city workers, first responders, businesses, and residents for any eventuality. There's a lot of different hazards that uh, could impact us here, ranging from uh, technical hazardous materials to uh, obviously earthquake. And so we want to make sure that we're prepared for any hazard that may come our way. Uh, the mission of uh, the Emergency Management Office will facilitate community disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery activities in order to provide a great place to live and work and visit. And um, as you know, within our strategic plan uh, for the city, uh, this falls within our key result areas of um, uh, support, community safety, and preparedness. And that's uh, the efforts that uh, the Emergency Management Program will uh, focus on. Our long-term goals are to develop a type three all hazard incident management team out of the city workers. Uh, what this is, is a, an incident management team uh, is trained together as a team um, and is, it's a performance-based, competency-based uh, system where we know that uh, the people that are trained have the requisite skills and can perform the duties of the particular positions uh, to uh, respond to a particular disaster and uh, bring order from chaos of that disaster. And so uh, we'll use that, um, that incident management team to lead the city through whatever ev eventuality may, may impact us here. We also want to focus on our disaster worker program, uh, our disaster service worker program, uh, and all the uh, city employees that are not part of the incident management team will still get um, training um, in particular job assignments that they may receive after a disaster, as well as uh, family readiness uh, training so that they can make sure that their families are taken care of while they still come to El Segundo and work during a, during a particular disaster. We also want to increase our first responder training. Many of the first responders have great training within their, um, within their spectrum of fire or police or public works, um, but there are also um, uh, very good Homeland Security and emergency management programs that are available to them that will kind of um, bridge them out of their normal uh, capacities and, and allow us to utilize their uh, tools and training and background into other areas during disasters as well. Um, we'd also like to increase our CERT program, our Community Emergency Response Team program, uh, and that's uh, an effort that uh, will really help prepare the neighborhoods and, um, and, the, and the community abroad, as well as our critical infrastructure. As you know, we have significant businesses uh, here in El Segundo that have uh, huge national economic impact, uh, Department of Defense impact, 
Um, and so we want to make sure that those critical infrastructure uh, businesses um, are prepared and um, are uh, able to share information during a disaster to help them rebound and be resilient and get back into business after a disaster so that we minimize um, any type of uh, long-term impacts to, to the business. And then finally, uh, public preparedness. Uh, we, we need to uh, focus on an awareness campaign, uh, reaching out to uh, community members, making sure they know how to care for themselves after a disaster. We don't have uh, or we have a, a very finite amount of resources available and during um, especially a, a big disaster like an earthquake uh, it's going to be hard to get to the entirety of the community so we need a community that can care for themselves for a time being and so we're going to be making sure that uh, through social media and uh, and other venues we're going to try to make sure that we can reach out to the public and and that they know what the hazards are and how to prepare for those hazards um, uh, and and be ready for any eventuality. So some of the key performance indicators, as you can see in the plan, um, this is on the last page of the plan, there's a lot more, but these are some key ones that I pulled out. 75% uh, of our incident management team members uh, will need to be qualified uh, based on uh, national uh, standards, credentialing standards. 85% of disaster service workers will have attended um, one training per year at a minimum and 25% of our first responders attend one of those Homeland Security Emergency Management trainings that I spoke of. Uh, we uh, intend to do 12 CERT training courses um, and make sure that those are conducted on, on a monthly basis. And, uh, and, and this is a, a big goal for us, but to really uh, recruit 1,700 members for the CERT program, uh, which is uh, significant considering our current numbers right now are bouncing around 350. Uh, and then uh, to ensure that, uh, that our, our, our responders and our uh, employees uh, know how to respond during a disaster, we're going to make sure that we exercise our plans. And to do so, we're going to do a tabletop e exercise annually, and then on every other year we'll do a functional exercise or a full-scale exercise uh, to make sure that um, we know that uh, we're operating in, in a, a level of operational readiness that is... Um, uh, that this city deserves. So that's kind of our focus. I know that there's uh, many other pages to this particular plan. Many of them are, uh, many of the pages are the analysis that I went through um, after being hired here in June and, and really determining what the needs are for the city. And, um, and that is there for your uh, reading pleasure. And uh, uh, aside from that, uh, happy to take any questions from you. Um, can you speak to, I know you did some recent CERT training, Randy, and it went really well. Can you speak to that really quickly if you have a moment, either now or at the end of uh, this discussion, just to get the word out there that this training is ongoing and how beneficial it was to the people that went. And I don't really have any questions because I was fortunate to get briefed with you, uh, with, by you with the mayor. Um, I just want to commend the mayor and the council for pushing forward on this and uh, doing what we need to do to prepare the city for the inevitable. So thank you for all your work on this. And sure. I most am looking forward to the tabletop and functional exercises. Thank you for including those. Yes, sir. Um, yes, we had a fall CERT Academy, um, and uh, that we had a huge success. As, as I understand it, the, the last time we ran a, a CERT class, we had very few attendees. And this particular class, I can't remember the numbers right off the top of my head, but it was in excess of, it was around 25 uh, um, students going through that program and um, and they all enjoyed it very much. The fire department who uh, really conducts the training uh, does an outstanding job in including them and in, in making it a, a lively event, um, culminating in a, in a little exercise that they do themselves and uh, it's really exciting for them. Uh, the best way that um, you can get signed up for uh, future trainings is to go to uh, the El Segundo website under the fire department there is uh, tab for um, CERP program and there you can sign up and enroll for um, being notified when the next class is going to be which um, I don't have the dates exactly on me but I know our next one is in January. Thank you we're very excited you're here. I attended the CERT class about seven years ago I would recommend it to anybody who lives or works in town it's very interesting you pay for a bag of equipment to have and you meet very nice people 
in the class and the practicum at the end, ours was at Chevron was fun and it was a practicum, so it was time well spent. So thank you, thank you for this presentation tonight and we're looking forward to all the good things you're doing for us. Thank you. Madam Clerk, roll call. Council Member Perstak, absent this evening. Council Member Brand. Present. Council Member Dugan. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Boyle. Here. Mayor Francis. Here. Now is the time for public communications related to city business only. Five minutes per person, 30 minutes total. How many people are speaking tonight? Okay. Now is your time. Honorable Mayor, distinguished council, thank you for the opportunity this evening. Bonnie Turner, your local public affairs representative for Southern California Edison. I've had the pleasure of being that person for several years now, but tonight I get to hand that baton over to my replacement in the city, Vic Knoll, who I'd like to introduce Vic. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, council members, uh, thank you, Connie. My name is Vic Knoll. I'll be your new government relations manager. Um, really looking forward to working with the city um, in the process right now of moving out of our Rosemead office down to our South Bay Service Center. So I apologize, I don't have cards yet. But I'll email you all individually with my contact information. Uh, please don't hesitate to contact me via my mobile or email if I can do anything for you uh, whatsoever. I also did want to put in a quick plug for our Edison International uh, scholarship program. It's still actually open. Uh, the application period is open until December 1st. So Edison International every year gives out $40,000 scholarships to 30 high school seniors that are planning to go study STEM. So I want to get the word out to the community. If you or members of the community know of high school students, uh, seniors that are planning on studying STEM, which is science, technology, engineering, math, that application period is still open. Well, December 1st, they should, uh, I would encourage them to apply. They can look on uh, SEE.com and get more information. Thank you. Thank you. Where is your South Bay uh, Services Center? It's in Torrance. Torrance? Yes, sir. Okay, you'll send your contact info? I will. Appreciate it. Good luck. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Welcome. Seeing no more public communications, we'll close council comments. Oh, sorry, opening public communications. Got caught in the, caught in the crowd in the back. Sorry about that. Uh, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and council members, I'm John Heffernan. I'm part of AT&T's external affairs team. And uh, just wanted to make some quick comments tonight on a uh, consent calendar, or sorry, consent agenda item, item number nine. Um, and you'll see in your package uh, that's titled Consideration and Possible Action to Adopt an Ordinance, adding Chapter 9 to Title 9 of the El Segundo Muni Code and amending Section 10-1-4 of the Muni Code to regulate the operation of unmanned aircraft, including drones in public parks and on public property throughout the city of El Segundo. Um, now this affects AT&T. We are a uh, commercial operator of drones. Uh, so these unassisted or unmanned aircraft systems are something that we're using now. It's a recent development, but we use it to inspect and, and uh, create maintenance plans for some of our cell uh, installations. So the request tonight is, uh, is, that we, is, that, is that you pause on the consideration and adoption of the ordinance, and we would request outreach and an invitation for comment from commercial operators of these drones or these unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, at the very least, we would ask um, for an exemption to be included to ensure that such, such restrictions and regulations don't apply to those drones operated by a person for a commercial purpose, pursuant to and obviously in compliance with FAA regulations, authorizations, or exemptions. Um, you know, there are situations where you can have a general commercial exemption, um, but if for some reason that's uh, not acceptable, we would ask that uh, language should expressly permit drone use by an owner or operator of 
critical of a critical infrastructure facility. So telecommunications facilities um, are defined as critical infrastructure. So we would ask that uh, city staff be directed to kind of further consider and, and work on the suggested language changes that I've just made and, and work with AT&T and other telecommunications carriers and other operators of critical infrastructure. So the requested exemptions are added to the ordinance prior to adoption. Thank you. Um, Mayor, would you mind if I ask a question? Certainly. I don't um, mind. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to point out that the only restriction is that you can't, that uh, drone operators can't land the drones or take off from public property, They're not prohibited from going over public property. Yeah, so, so, so more and more our facilities, especially the smaller ones, are located in the public right of way. So our, our maintenance folks and the operators of these vehicles could be and should be in the public right of way when they you actually want to land these and take off from the public right away. Well, I'm not an expert on how they use them. Like I mm -hmm. said, it's it's a new uh, and emerging use for us. Um, they're using them right now in Puerto Rico to provide cell service. But Again, we're not we're not trying to keep them out of the right. We just don't want them landing. Or the ordinance just says you can't land or take off from public property. It doesn't say you can't go over. <coughs> Correct. So that, as it's written, we would have to find a piece of private property to. That's correct. Yeah, our facilities are in the public right away. So, again, we're just asking for the opportunity to, to work on the language. And I just wanted to clarify because I make sure I understood. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Any more public communications? Seeing none, we'll close public communications. Council comments. I just have a question. I know we, we've been talking about the drones off and on for quite some time, and um, we were waiting on the FAA, and then we were waiting on some other um, guidance. I, how are, have other cities come across this, Mark, that you're familiar with, this issue of the kind of the public utility infrastructure and being mm -hmm. able to? Uh, this is the first time I've heard it. I, I haven't heard it in my, the other cities that I'm familiar with, um, but I, I I am a bit surprised, and I don't know. Um, I talked to the gentleman, tried to understand better. I guess the issue is do you want to allow the public utilities to take off and land uh, their drones in public right of ways or public parks, et cetera? And just haven't been approached with that issue before. I will take direction from the council as to what you want me to do. And that, that will come up on your, we can, you can, well, you can pull that one in the consent calendar yeah. comes up. Yeah, that will pull up from the consent calendar. Thank you. You, you said public utility, but AT&T, isn't that a private? It is, but it's regulated by the Public Utilities FCC. Commission, so. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? We'll pick it up during the. Okay. Very questions. good. Procedural motion, consideration of a motion to read all ordinances and resolutions on the agenda by title only. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 4-0. Let's see. All right. So this is the time and place here to fix for a public hearing. Consideration and possible action regarding approval of El Segundo's climate action plan. The proposed climate action plan is not subject to the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act in that it does not constitute a project pursuant to 14 California Code of Regulations 15378. Approval of the CAP does not legally bind the city and does not include enactment or amendment of the El Segundo <coughs> Municipal Code or the adoption and amendment of the general plan or elements thereof. The applicant is the city of El Segundo and the fiscal impact is NA. So city clerk was proper notice of a hearing given in a timely manner? Yes, it was. And has any written communication been received? None. Okay. The public hearing is now open. City clerk will make the presentation. Uh, Paul Samaris, our principal planner, and Kim Fuentes from the South Bay Council of Governments will make this presentation. Uh, good evening. Uh, Mayor and uh, members of the City Council. 
the city has worked for the last uh, two years with the South Bay COG um, to develop a plan that can help the city with reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions. The Climate Action Plan contains goals, uh, objectives, policies covering energy use, transportation, land use, and other areas. These goals and policies are options that the city can consider when making decisions in the future about things such as energy programs or regulations, transportation projects, or updates to specific plans or the general plan. Uh, Kim Fuentes is the project manager with the South Bay COG, and she has coordinated with uh, 15 cities, including El Segundo, in order to develop individual climate action plans for each city. She'll be giving you a brief presentation on El Segundo's uh, climate action plan. And uh, I just wanted to um, briefly thank uh, staff from several departments that assisted in this effort, uh, you, the council, for providing us guidance on this over the last couple of years, uh, the city's environmental committee for assisting with this and contributing, and also to mention that the environmental committee met, uh, reviewed the plan, and uh, voted to recommend approval of the plan by the city council. And um, also, after the presentation, we'll, we'll be available to take questions, and we recommend that uh, you reopen the public hearing, take testimony, and then at the conclusion, adopt the ordinance, uh, approving, the resolution approving the Climate Action Plan. And I'll turn it over to Kim. Good evening. Uh, Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem and Council members, for this opportunity to come tonight and talk to you about the wonderful work that your staff has done, as well as your Environmental Commission and um, looking along with our consultant team of Studio 111 and Fair and Pierce, there are technical assistants and I do have them in the audience today in case you have questions, technical questions. So the purpose of climate action planning, of course, primarily is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it's, it's um, also very importantly a visioning document for the city. It provides you an opportunity to secure funding and it also supports your city policies. This is your document. It's meant to forward the things that you want to forward. A little bit of background. Uh, the basis of every climate action plan is a greenhouse gas emissions inventory, which was completed already working with your city staff and consultant teams. Um, you have already adopted targets, which was the next step. The targets that you adopted were 15% below 2005 levels. 2005 is actually your baseline. Everything will be measured against that year by 2020. And then you also have a longer term goal, which is 49% below 2005 by 2035. And that was um, both of that was actually happened in um, 2015. At the same time, you also adopted your energy efficiency chapter of your climate action plan. Now we've come to you with the remaining sections and remaining chapters, which is land use transportation, solid waste, urban greening, energy generation, and storage. This is just a quick snapshot of the sources uh, that are in your city. And you can see primarily the largest sources of um, GHG are your commercial energy use as well as your um, transportation. This slide actually provides you a lot of information, tells you where you are, what would happen if you adopt your plan as it's presented to you, and how that relates to your targets. The, let's see if I got this, the top line here is your business as usual forecast. The difference here in red is your adjusted, adjusted business as usual forecast. So in other words, it was whatever was in law, state law, at the time of your last inventory, which was in 2012. And this is specifically what the city will gain from those activities. This section here represents already your adopted energy efficiency measures. That's what you hope to gain as you implement those. Very small here, you're gonna see, um, here's your transportation, and then there's some other um, lines here that represent both your greening and your solid waste. Those are very small sources. In any climate action plan, those are very small sources, and so there's not as a lot that you can do, and they're not gonna make as big of a difference. <clears throat> Excuse me, and then the difference here is what would be, uh, what is needed to be, um, it's a difference in, your, in the goals versus what you're gonna implement. And the first dot here is your 2020 goal 
and your last dot here is your 2035 goal. So while the city currently is, is, doesn't look like you're gonna meet your 2020 goal, you are definitely on track and well in meeting your 2035 goal based on this plan. This is just a quick overview of the chapters that are included in the Climate Action Plan. And this is a representation of what would be um, reduced by chapter. So you can see here again, the majority of the emission reductions are going to be energy efficiency, then you have land use and transportation, and then you have waste. Do not have as much shown here for graining. Again, those are very small. And energy generation and storage were not calculated as those are exploratory at this time. Your plan is organized with goals, measures, and sub-strategies, and they were selected from a menu of strategies, um, working with your city staff as well as your commission, and they were presented to them, and we did calculations specifically for your city. Um, again, it's a visioning document for the city to think about your future programs and policies that best match the needs of your city, and it's also meant to look at things that you maybe haven't thought of yet? Um, is it something you want to do some more explore, uh, exploration in? Or if you had funding, could you do those things? What is very unique about your plan that is not, uh, has not been done for any other climate action plan is that you have your land use and transportation strategies that include the Sustainable South Bay strategy that's specific to the South Bay because um, we are very built out and a lot of climate action planning focuses on areas that are not as built out as we are. And so the, based on um, many years of research, uh, there were strategies that were developed specifically for the South Bay. We worked with Fair and Pierce to incorporate and to quantify those strategies for the first time. Most climate action plans, oops, most climate action plans are based on this CAPCOA document this is the methodology that's used, and you can see that it was done in 2010, done based on the best available data at the time. Did not include electric vehicles, for example. You have a beautiful charging station out there that I used this afternoon. That was not quantified in that with that document. And then just briefly, the chapters. This is your land use and transportation. It includes things like electric vehicles, like I just talked about. And each chapter also has a list of co-benefits that helps you um, position the plan and the city to get additional funding. So you can talk about co-benefits such as safer streets, for example. This is your solid waste. And um, this are things like diversion of solid waste. You have a lot of this that you're already doing and quite a few laws have come in place. Your urban greening. Um, this is like promoting your grain medians and also uh, promoting like things like farmers markets and that kind of thing. And then of course your energy generation and storage of uh, things like community choice aggregation for example, which I think you've been talking about or I know your city staff has been looking into. And here is the next steps. Um, the COG, of course, is here to help you implement these things. Many of the things that are in your climate action plan are based on programs that the COG does and helps provide to the cities. And so we plan on continuing to do that for you as well. We will also help staff monitor and evaluate, so measure these things so that we can give you really good reports so you can come back and talk to, um, see your progress over time. Um, and then also, collectively, because you have a climate action plan with, a long, uh, a, a, with our other 15 cities, we can go and we're stronger in our grant applications. We can bring resources like the development of this plan, for example. It would cost the city a lot of money to do it on its own. Not as much. So, and that's my conclusion here tonight. Do you have questions? Thank you. Shall we wait for public communication to close and then we'll ask him questions so thank you Kim Kim Fuentes no relation okay so the public 
hearing is now open for, or has been open for public input, if anybody would like to speak to this. Surprise. I'm surprised that I'm here. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Boyles, Honorable Council Members, and those watching from in here or at home. Mm -hmm. My name is Tracy Miller Zarnicki, and I'm currently serving as the Chair of the Environmental Committee. Uh, also in the room, we have members Chris Lubes and Rachel McPherson. Uh, so we are here to reiterate now the uh, support that we have for the city's acknowledgement and approval of this plan. Uh, as we've expressed before, we believe that the city must take more responsibility for our local efforts or our local effects on the environment. And we're pleased to know the city's been already helping develop this plan and that voted on actually the most uh, effective part of the plan, voted to uh, adopt a resolution for that in December 2015. As I've said before, we recognize the very existence of our city sprung from heavy industrial production. We're grateful that our neighboring businesses have been mindful of keeping their emissions at bay as much as they have over these years. But these emissions are something we have to manage and keep an eye on because that will greatly affect the climate as much science and EPA can tell you. I won't rattle off all the facts I brought here because you probably don't need that at this time. But I just want to say we thank you for your consideration of the three plus years of work that have gone into preparing this plan. And we are here to embrace and enact upon any parts of the plan that we can to help make a difference uh, upon your approval. Anyone else like to comment? Okay. Seeing none, motion to close public hearing. So, so moved. moved. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, four zero, thank you. So council discussion. I have a question. This might be for Kim. Um, the energy, the biggest portion of the reductions in greenhouse gas, the energy efficiencies, are those state mostly state mandates that have come through through building codes or is that, how has that been? So a couple different things. One is at the time of your inventory in 2012, there were some things that were in state law that were going to be implemented. And so that is your adjusted to business as usual forecast. The remainder of the plan makes up the difference. So this green right here is actually not what's in state law. This is what you're planning to do for your community. Wow, okay, that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Brown. Yeah, I just wanna say um, it's great that we're a member and participating with the COG because uh, there's so many additional uh, assets and resources available through that in so many ways and just makes us uh, more powerful to unify this across the South Bay through through the call does so much for uh, the city members thank you thank you I really don't have any I'm just trying to look at this and figure out how my life's going to be different in the next couple of years I don't really I'm trying to process that so I know you talk about the transportation side of it and other things, but a retired guy, you know, I don't, I don't like to, I'm just trying to, I'm struggling with that right now, so. Electric golf cart. Yeah. I walk. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> so I echo Dr. Brand talking about the COG. Thank you, Kim and everyone else. I'm very involved in the COG. I think everybody here has attended meetings and committees and it's, it's a really powerful organization for us to be in. It, the only questions I have is when it says the fiscal impact is NA. As I go through this and I read the different items, I actually see more work for staff in it. So to me, that's not an NA, that's an upper, a cost upper. And so that concerns me. I, the administrative I mean, cost of it. Pardon? The administrative cost of it. Yes. Yeah, yeah but that takes staff to do, and there's things like parking and and giving preferential parking to to EV or electric vehicles or or um, the meters, and we don't have any meters in town. I mean, there's just there's a lot of things. This isn't really. For you, Kim, it's more for staff that I, I see things that um, are going to cost us money. And then it talks about things like organizational strategies and what I would call hoteling, 
uh, to encourage businesses to have their people work somewhere else, not come to town. And I'm just curious how that works with business license taxes. If somebody is an employee of a business in town, but they either work from home or they work at a location that's closer to their home, how that works. And it talks about car sharing. And we did have car to go here for a while until they pulled out of our, our region. But, and it seems like there's some things that would impact downtown. And I just wondered if the Downtown Association has had a chance to look at any of these or to comment on things that could impact them. Some of it was the parking. And then it talks about things like the city will work to increase residents' participation in existing energy efficiency programs. How are we going to do that? Um, Also promote, incentivize, require residential home energy renovations. Um, in support of this measure, the city will implement streamline panel upgrade when it does not involve relocation. I'm just wondering who's, who's paying for all this staff or how are we going to collect those funds and fees to do all of this? I'm not opposed to what's being said. I'm just wondering how we're paying for this. Hire designated energy advocate. Who's going to pay for it? So, there's lots of these. I have them, I mean, these questions almost on every page. So, some of those services are provided through the COG, aren't they, on, on behalf That's, of all the cities? Yes, that is true. And something like an advocate, for example, we work with um, Edison, which came today as well as we have an energy engineer that works for the COG that can help. And we've done things like Green Building Challenge, which I know um, the mayor has gone and out to the business community. Um, the, the strategies and um, the um, measures are um, um, exploratory. They are meant to, for example, if you wanted to work with your business association, we could meet with a business association and talk to them about that, you know, how these things could be implemented. Um, it's really meant to a lot of the uh, uh, accounting for the greenhouse gases, for example, is looking at what your current practices are and trying to just capture that. And there's ways that we can do that as well. So I don't know if there's more that you wanted to add, but it's really meant to the next step is actually figuring out how you implement it and how you go about identifying funding and you can, you know, definitely not implement something that you don't have a resource for, of course, but a lot of them are best practices. Well, and as the mayor points out, there's real costs there. And if we can quantify those, then um, we can uh, begin to budget accordingly as we go. But uh, we need to realize that this isn't going to be free. This is something we've got to finance here. Good points. And it's non punitive. The goals we don't meet correct. are not punished for. That's yeah. correct. So. You can go at your own pace. It's meant to be over several years. It's not, you know, if you have a five year, you can look at 20 years. Uh, Mayor, I just want to add that uh, you mentioned the uh, fiscal impact NA. That is because uh, the immediate fiscal impact is not affected immediate and fiscal impact. As the city looks ahead at these goals or options and tries to make decisions or wants to study some of these strategies, that's when we would look into, just as Kim said, potential funding sources to help with certain programs or certain actions. So I think TBD or something is more accurate than NA because there are fees associated. Mm -hmm. There's a fiscal impact. You know, there, there are things that staff is working on every day that, that probably aren't realized as being environmentally beneficial. But for instance, public works staff is working with Edison to replace all of our street lights with LED lights. Mm -hmm. The planning and building department, <coughs> when they review development plans, they do provide preference now to clean air vehicles in the parking locations. Um, they're working, planning and building and public works are working with the MTA on a bike sharing program. So there are a number of things that, that are going on um, that, that are part of our, our way of doing business now, and I, I think that that's a direction that the city continues to go in. Great. 
AB 32 was a state measure to reduce greenhouse gas. So what, what, what are the compliance requirements for AB 32 in the future at the city level? So there's nothing that it requires the city to do anything. Um, your goals that you set are in line with what the state wants to accomplish. So in a way, it's kind of saying this is what we can do at the city level to help the state meet its goals. So there's not at this time a requirement for cities. And of all the cities represented in the COG, which cities have approved or rejected some variation of this plan? So we just started presenting to city councils. And so I have, we have two meetings tonight. And um, so you're only our second meeting. And we had one other meeting that was on the Hill and they, it was a discussion item. And then there's, um, count, the staff is bringing it back for approval in December. So you're just one of our first ones. Great. You're the leaders. That's right. <laughs> Again, I'm just looking for the actions behind it. I don't know what those are going to be. You know, you're, you're showing reductions, and I'm guessing that's a million tons of CO2 up there, and you're just, you know, I don't know what the actions are behind those reductions, and I'm just looking for that piece of it. So, I don't know. Mom and apple pie. I want cleaner air, so uh, I'm... I don't know what to do other than say I'm okay, but I don't, I don't know what we're going to do to get there. And I hear we're taking some small steps along the way here, but uh, I'm waiting to see a little more meat. <laughs> Thank you. City Attorney, will you read the resolution by title only? Yes, Mayor, and um, did the public hearing get closed? Um, yeah, we had a motion to close it. Okay, I'm sorry. A resolution approving the City of El Segundo Climate Action Plan is uh, ready for adoption. May I have a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Abstain, yeah, I don't know what time we'll get here, so yeah. So that's 301, approve Bran, Boyles, Fuentes, Abstain, Dugan. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Kim and staff, for coming tonight. <clears throat> and thank you to our environmental committee for coming tonight. Tracy, for speaking. All right. Reports of committees, commissions, and boards. Consideration and possible action to announce the appointments to the Arts and Cultural Advisory Committee. Fiscal impact none. Okay, I know we say this all the time, but it's true. We get so many incredibly talented, engaged folks to apply for our committees, commissions, and boards, and tonight was no exception. We held interviews for the Arts and Cultural Committee, and tonight we are appointing six very talented, engaged people. Michael Kresge to a partial term expiring June 30th, 2019. George Renfo to a partial term expiring June 30th, 2020. Jeff Kaysen and Julie Todd to full terms expiring June 30th, 2019. Neil Von Flew and Kirsten Dorsey to full terms expiring June 30th, 2020. And you may ask, six people, how did you decide who gets what term? <laughs> yeah. We have a very scientific way where we write the term on little pieces of paper and each council member takes turns pulling that as a name is announced. That's how they are assigned their, their terms. And, and, and the so intent is that nobody, they don't all come due at the same time and you don't have to replace the, you know, the entire committee. So trying to spread it out a little bit. There. So thank you to everybody who, who applied to serve and we're very grateful for your service. Consent agenda, any polls? Item nine, Let's please. pull that one. Mm -hmm. It's uh, consideration and possible action to adopt an ordinance adding chapter nine First to title nine. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Any other pulls? No. Okay, do I have a motion to approve item three, four, five, six, seven, and eight? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Four, zero. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Item, item nine, nine, consideration and possible action to adopt an ordinance adding chapter nine to title nine of the El Segundo Municipal Code and amending section 10-1-4 of the Municipal Code to regulate the operation of unmanned aircraft, including drones in public parks and on public property throughout the city of El, El Segundo, fiscal impact NA. I pulled it just in light of um, that gentleman's testimony or public comment about 
the um, impact that it might have on their commercial operations, just to better understand that. I don't think that's something that we anticipated or had heard of. Yeah, I don't understand it. Uh, well, it's uh, up to the council how you want to proceed. You can either ad uh, adopt the ordinance or move forward to adopt it. Um, we can um, continue this for a, to a date certain, and we can meet with the utilities and see what their issues are. I did speak with Ken Berkman briefly. In theory, we could modify the ordinance to, um, you know, my understanding is, you know, dro drones do have the ability to go straight up and down with regard to landing. Um, you know, potentially, we could create an encroachment permit process. We would want to control, know when these are going to happen, and just like we would do with any other use of the right-of-way, we require encroachment permits and things be cordoned off appropriately and public safety issues. Um, well, this is a new issue. Um, wouldn't have thought, you know, <coughs> 10 years ago we'd talk about flying machines landing in our uh, right-of-way, but, you know, this is, this is where we are, so we can, we can certainly continue this and uh, talk with the utilities and bring it back to the council. I think we should continue. Also, there are restrictions for flying drones within a certain distance from the airport. Yeah. They so have to get permission from the, um, they have to notify the, uh, uh, the tower at the airport and yes. It, so would this be part of that process? Uh, we don't regulate that process. We're aware that that's a, mm -hmm. a process, but it's a, it's a federal requirement. So we don't actually regulate it. We could, Just with the holidays coming up, perhaps I, I don't know that this is urgent. I mean, it's been on the uh, it's been in the works for a while. We gathered information from various sources to deal with this, but just to make sure with the holidays coming up and whatnot that we have adequate time. And the council doesn't usually meet the first meeting in January. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we continue this to January 16th. Or how, how about the first meeting in February? That's fine. I think so that's yeah. better. You yeah. know, I think this should be continued because. What came up tonight, we really, I, don't, I still don't understand it fully. I'd like to know how other cities have dealt with it. You haven't heard about it, and uh, before we just push ahead, I think we should figure it out. Right. Yes, I Mr. Heffernan, if you have information what other cities do, then we can have staff reach out to you, and you can provide what you know. Absolutely. Yeah. This is all, you know, Pretty new. I mean, these are just starting right. to be regulated. I mean, most of the regulations by the federal government and the state. We have very little um, to say over this issue, and it's the right of way. And I uh, appreciate what the utilities' concerns are. So we'll talk to them and then bring this back on February sixth. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be my desire that you know this is a new technology that's going to be helpful out there, and it, and there's I have absolutely no problem with any kind of utility company or even you know people that are out there that are going to take aerial photography in some places there's I don't have any issue with somebody a, a crew going out there having a power on you know the, the pole top problem then when I get a picture of it they can put a drone up there take it off from the street take a picture bring it back look at it and there's not absolutely nothing wrong with that in my in the, in the concept of how we ought to be able to include that in the ordinance in my opinion so we ought to be able to make that work make it feasible and and there's going to be other applications as technology improves when we go forward for these things that just a blanket prohibition of flying these things around on city property maybe doesn't, maybe it isn't in the best interest of what's going on out there. So, and and I'd hate to, I'd hate to burden us with a permitting process that requires everybody to get a permit every time you want to go take a look at something. Yeah, we'll talk about that at the staff level. It does, um, I mean, to the extent you're particularly talking about taking off and landing in the right of way, there are cars and whatnot, and you know if you're going to do something like that. You can all work with the public works director and the utilities and understand how that would occur. And we obviously want to be um, business friendly and whatnot, but you know, I just need to understand the safety issues too. Yeah. Huh? And, but That's there are organizations out there. I know through you know people at AirMap. Um, last week, Barbara Voss and I attended the Soon Chung Innovation Awards, and AirMap won one of the very prestigious awards. So I think we have resources also that. We can reach out to and see what other cities and municipalities are doing. Okay, so we are going to continue this to February 6th. Thank you.
New business, consideration of possible action regarding traffic and pedestrian safety for the 1200 block of East Acacia and surrounding neighborhoods during the annual holiday lights event, commonly known as Candy Cane Lane, fiscal impact none. City Manager. Mayor, members of council, we had a request made to um, make some changes to traffic patterns in a block adjacent to Candy Cane Lane. Our police department and public work staff have reviewed that. Um, I think you're gonna hear from uh, Acting Captain Garcia tonight about some of the concerns about that request, but also concerns and, and I think a desire on, on staff's part to talk about the city's involvement in this, this event in general. It has become quite um, popular and, and is attracting large crowds and, and um, we do feel it's probably time for the city to, to <coughs> take some additional actions or, or to become more involved in, in this, um, the traffic and pedestrian activity around this event. So we'll start with, with Acting Captain Garcia and if. Ken Berkman can answer questions regarding the uh, street closure as well. Um, Honorable Mayor, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council, um, I'm here on behalf of uh, Chief uh, Bill Whalen, uh, related to a staff report that he wrote, indicating uh, there was some concerns about traffic safety. So I'm kind of I'm going to try and bifurcate this. We'll talk specifically about the 1200 block of East Acacia, and I will I will let Ken Berkman and uh, Lieutenant Lehman discuss the issues related to the 1100 block, uh, specifically the 1200 block. Um, as you know, this has been a very popular event year after year. And with the advent of social media, it has become an even more popular event. And so we do have uh, an issue that we think that we should take a look at. And the issue is, is prior, um, years prior, we've used soft closures. And we obviously know where Candy Cane Lane is located. And we use soft closures as a, a means of keeping vehicular traffic out. Um, that doesn't mean that a car can't roll through and continue to injure innocent people there just enjoying the evening. Um, however, it comes with its pros and cons if we decide to either maintain soft closures, and I think that is um, the wishes of many people in the 1200 block of East Acacia to keep it as is. If the city decides to go with hard closures, there are options available. None of them are cheap and some of them really can't do it, and we've heard many. Um, I think the people on the 1200 block are amenable to having bollards installed. The problem is that that's for the future because to get them in place right now is really not feasible based on contracts and, and monies that need to be spent to tear up the street to do that. Um, those would be removable bollards, and we could talk about that, I think, at a later date. Um, another would be K-rails, we've heard that. The problems with K-rails, um, they have to be removed, meaning we have to have access for emergency vehicles to go in and out. K-rails, even if you stagger them, you can't get a fire truck around to negotiate in that small space. So K-rails aren't really an option. Another is vehicles. We thought about we can maybe put some vehicles. It's a viable option. However, um, police ourselves, we're kind of strapped for personnel. Um, we can certainly probably drop them off. The problem is moving them if needed. Um, we can come up with some kind of plan maybe to work with the fire department if we decide to put vehicles there that if they do come, they can move them themselves. Um, that's an option that we could talk about later. Uh, another option is, uh, if we can go to the last slide. Sorry, sir. They have these, uh, you can rent these and you can rent them or buy them. And uh, it looks like, let me have our, my math here. For the, the event time, um, it'll cost the city about 22800 just to rent them, if we wanted to rent them. And they make them expensive because the, the company really wants you to buy them. And uh, the problem with that, with those, they do move. However, um, they're not easy to move. So if an emergency vehicle had to make its way in for a fire or to, to assist someone that needed help, it would be very difficult to get around. Um, they work, they're expensive, but uh, I don't know if they're that practical for this particular event. Um, what we're really looking at is what's the likelihood of a significant event occurring? It's very small, it's minute. Um, however, it's a possibility. Anything can happen and we just don't know when. So I think it's important for us to have this in the back of our mind, uh, possibly make bigger plans for the future, but I think in the short term, it's probably the best idea to come up with some kind of vehicular obstacle that either the police can come out and move if needed, give the fire department access to our vehicle to move it, and I'm talking some old unmarked police cars 
that we can put out there. And uh, at least that provides some level of protection because I think our citizens deserve that um, because this has really become a de facto city event. And uh, related to the 1100 block, I'm sorry, the 1100 block of uh, East Acacia, I'll turn this over to, to Ken Berkman and uh, Officer, I'm sorry, Lieutenant Jeff Lehman. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, did you have any questions? I'm sorry. <laughs> so the 1200 block, the Candy Cane Lane, if I recall, it started in the mid uh, to late 1960s. It was started by Ken Bailey, who later moved and was a neighbor of mine on California Street when he started this in the middle of Acacia. So it's been going on. Didn't we just celebrate was it 50 or 60 years last year? A long, long time. So my question is, what, what's the record there? What incidents have we had uh, that you've had to deal with over the decades? Um, I can't tell you off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I know at least in the uh, 1100 block, we didn't have any incidents last year. And to my recollection, none in the 1200 block. I'm related for uh, you know, calls for emergency services. Mm-hmm. And, oh, and you've been here a long time over. Been here 25 years. I, I, I do not remember anything significant occurring. I'm not saying that something hasn't happened, but uh, nothing significant like fires or things like that. Right. Be more like uh, arguments, fights, uh, a heart attack or something. Occurring. I would imagine that would be that kind accurate. of thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, um, it's kind of related to the the vehicle option. I know, like for the fireworks, you guys staged a couple of vehicles where you thought you might be vulnerable. I think. Yes. What were the? How many numbers of people there as opposed to the whole time this thing's going on? Roughly, in terms of visitors to Candy Cane Lane, twelve hundred block versus the fireworks or something. Um, I don't think it's as large, but it's becoming <laughs> as large. Um, even if you Google the, I'm sorry, you do a Google map and it comes up Candy Cane Lane. And so it's really developed. I think it's, it's growing. It's a, it's a draw for the local area and it's a, it's a, a great thing for people to see. So they come to our city. It's a safe city. And, um, uh, I, I can imagine in the future it's going to grow as large as our, as our fireworks show. Ours and, is a little bit unique too, right? Because ours is a dead end. Whereas I've been to others, like I think in Torrance, where you drive through and it's yeah. kind of like a moving tour, but there's not a stop at the end. There's not a stop. And really, when you have that kind of traffic, it takes care of itself because it's moving so slow. I know that Torrance has a, a similar candy cane lane. Downey has one. And it's really a drive through. Mm -hmm. And because the, uh, the line of traffic is so great, the speeds are, are you can walk faster than the cars. Right. right. Thank you. I'm wondering also, just real quick, sorry, if we couldn't get some companies in town to, would there be a liability issue for the city if we had a person or a company's vehicles parked there to save money? Maybe they have a little advertising on the side of their... I mean, I'm like not even thinking, mine aren't even based in town anymore. I got kicked out of town, but I'm thinking of some other company. Asking for a or, friend? Yeah. yeah. As far as liability concerns, I think that'd be a legal question for our, our, our attorney to, to weigh in on. Uh, however, we just don't have the reliability of the person to move the car if needed. And uh, uh, that's why, at least if we have control of it, that we can move it. I wouldn't ask the residents to put their car there because we don't know. And the other thing is, this is another issue that's going to come up, is if we do put our cars there, um, absent, let's take the opening night out and every other night, the residents still come in and out. And so how are we going to address that issue? Because if we park a car, they're not going anywhere. But both sides of the block have alleys and garages, right? The alleys are off of, they, they can't access them from their residence. No, I mean, can't. Only, only the north side. Just the north side? Yeah. Mm. Yes, there's people parking in the alleys. There's park, they're going to park everywhere. Okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hello, Lieutenant Lehman. Hi, Mayor. Yes, sir. Hello, um, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, to follow up one point I didn't hear, um, Acting Chief Garcia mentioned the 1200 block Candy Cane Lane is actually a block 
permit, block party permit that's issued through recreation and parks, just to, uh, to clarify that. Um, Public Works does provide um, type three barricades, the movable barricades for folks to put out and take away um, to close and open the street from the six to 10 o'clock hours. So um, I'm here to update the surrounding areas part of the agenda title. And specifically, there was a uh, request made to the Traffic Safety Committee from the, uh, a resident of the 1100 block of East Acacia on um, November 8th. And typically, the Traffic Safety Committee meets um, at least quarterly based on a, a volume of requests that we get um, for this situation where we have the holidays in Candy Cane Lane right around the corner. We met the next day on the 9th uh, to consider the request. Um, the Traffic Safety Committee consists of uh, Public Works, myself and our Streets Division uh, supervisor, and uh, the traffic safety staff from the police department. Um, in short, the, uh, the request was to modify the traffic flow by uh, providing one-way traffic for the 1100 block of East Acacia, um, traveling westbound as well as California Street between Walnut and Acacia uh, going northbound, um, along with some partial and, and full closures in, uh, at various points. And in short, the, uh, the request was denied, and uh, I'll, I'll get into the details of that rationale, but um, you know, the interesting part of these types of requests and, and the folks at, at Sheldon have heard this from me and, and from PD uh, related to Clutters Park and the issues. Anytime we look to consider modifying traffic flow or putting physical mitigation measures in the roadways or restricting parking of any sort, you're taking in all likelihood a problem and expanding it outwards to other streets and other neighbors. And that is uh, the general basis for the denial for this situation, because that's in all likelihood what we would see happening. The, um, you know, the interesting thing about traffic engineering, as far as engineering goes, is it's as much art and human behavioral science as it is actual engineering. You know, we, as uh, engineers, have the physical um, roadway design components of the road grade, the curvature, the speed limit, and everything else that we put into it, but it's also driver behavior and how um, comfortable folks are being at speed. So speed surveys, for example, always occur, are set at 85th percentile, meaning in general you take a survey and 15% of the, of the drivers are going faster than that speed, and that's basically how we set our speed limit. So that's a, a, a prime example. So this traffic pattern, if we look at it, um, by creating the two one-way streets, you would essentially be creating kind of a, let's call it a, a mall parking lot feel of, we're going to visit this prime location and start circling around. And granted, the, there, there is the benefit of removing the two-way, essentially removes a conflict, let's say. There's two-way traffic that is a conflict when there's so much going on and making it one way does smooth that out, let's say, and reduce that chance of conflict. Um, that the folks are, are saying they see out there. But to go through and circle around with, with your family, now maybe I'm looking to continue this loop for as long as I feel comfortable, maybe stop and wait on California or East Acacia to find a parking spot, follow people, maybe cause more congestion. Um, you know, if we get drivers get tired of that, then we're looking to go down Center Street, and this is where the impacts start going further outside of the area itself. Um, looking down Center Street and Walnut, possibly Sycamore, um, further east on Acacia, McCarthy. So sure, that does happen now. We know that. It's a huge event. But to take away that other way of traffic and allow people to circulate, people who, by the way, are from almost always out of town, and pretty much are only visiting one. It's not like you repeat this visit and you get used to the traffic pattern, and it's a temporary traffic pattern each day anyway. So that is something for us that we considered. Um, as um, 
Acting Chief Garcia said um, the police and fire departments had no records of any incidences or accidents last year. Um, that was one thing that was, that was mentioned in the request. The, uh, another thing for us, for, for the Traffic Safety Committee that we considered, the police departments, in, if, if this was implemented, the police department's area of um, enforcement requirements and duration, by the way, because it's every night temporary, would increase. And not only for the area of enforcing the do not enter signs or the one-way traffic, uh, which um, police has told us people will ignore that. Some people will say, I'm going to get that spot and, and blow by these things, and that is an enforcement issue. Um, it also goes for public works because we would need to um, install and remove the do not enter in one-way signs. So that's another consideration of, of the overtime possibilities that would need for uh, the resources to, to properly take care of this. Um, and two, two last points. One of the interesting things that we looked at, you know, recently, uh, probably eight months ago, we, we visually narrowed Park Place due to uh, a request to slow down the perceived speeding cars on, on that stretch there, and we have shoulder stripes. So visually, that narrows the roadway. It does slow people down. People out there that are requested have said they, they appreciate that and they see the effects. Putting this one-way section in the same width of roadway uh, with the same parking on both sides, now folks see a wider path of travel as opposed to worrying about a car coming at them. So it could result in, if you're not sitting there waiting for a spot or driving real slow to see if folks are going to pull out so you can get a spot, you may increase your speed because you'll feel more comfortable. You have more width in the roadway. And likewise, pedestrians will feel more comfortable walking in a wider space of the roadway, because that's, that's the crux of the real reason for the request, is the, the vast amounts of pedestrians and cars in the, in the roadway. So that's something that we considered as well. Um, ultimately, if we, we, we um, spoke to the requester that if, we, if the city was going to pursue this further, um, we'd want to see support from the community uh, that would be impacted, California and Acacia, but also um, Center and Walnut properties uh, owners, similar to our permit parking program, where our code requires a 55% support for that petition to be considered and, and for per preferential parking uh, permit areas to be installed. So if that was to come to us in the end uh, for our and, and council's consideration, we could move forward with the, the, the proper way to do it would be to have a traffic engineering firm come in and take a look at this, take a look at the actual request and see if the impacts that we're foreseeing are valid because they're specialists, they do this all the time, it's their area of expertise. Uh, maybe propose other solutions that could help this, pro this, this issue that, uh, or problem that, that the folks are seeing. Um, it would probably involve, from a timing perspective, you want to get um, traffic counts, meaning vehicles and pedestrians and bikes and people that are the users of the roadway during a non-holiday time, come back and do it during this event so you can, they can compare the two and see where the, the traffic patterns and pedestrian patterns are, and they can further analyze that and see if this is something we should do or if things are okay um, and how we would go forward. So um, I appreciate the time to let me get that all out, and I'm here for, I'm here for any questions. Unless Lieutenant Lee, you want to? <laughs> well, I actually there's a couple other things. I I'm on the traffic safety committee with Ken, so I share the same concerns. Um, two other concerns: barricades for law-abiding citizens mean don't go here, but we deal with a lot of people that don't. There is always the risk of people going around our barricades. I think the risk is much greater when we have a bunch of people that feel like they can be in the street in those areas. I know we're talking about closing down cul-de-sac, but all the way back to the 1100 block where Acacia meets center back in that area. People will go around those barricades. We will not be out there to enforce that. So we've got people, we've got a lot of people expecting all the traffic flow will be going westbound. There will be eastbound cars. People will drive around. It will cause chaos. 
causes danger. The other thing is, um, I think people also expect a normal traffic flow on these streets. And my, one of my concerns is when we change the traffic flow and it's all westbound, I do have concerns about people walking in the street and what are we taught, look left, look right, look left again, looking left and getting hit. It's not uncommon for that to happen. I know someone who's personally been hit, Gar Captain Garcia, um, a foreign country looking the wrong way. I have concerns about that too. Thank you. And if it were one way, it would have to be one way 24 hours a day. There wouldn't be a time that it's swapped around because some cars would be parked in the opposite direction. That's so. right. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Council comments? Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm. We're trying to accommodate an event here, and it seems like we're really over-engineering this thing 100%. So I understand there's issues with liabilities, and people are concerned about that. But, you know, we're, we're going through traffic rules, and, you know, I don't want to study this thing. I just want to allow the event to occur somehow and, and be response, res responsive to the people that are looking to try and make it a little easier for their own homes and, uh, and you know, traffic in and out of the area there. So... I mean, every year you go, you park farther and farther away from this thing and you walk to it. So, um, you know, we shouldn't spend a dime doing traffic studies on this. We ought to be able to go out there and park a car somewhere and stop traffic if that's what we need to do in an area and, and move it if we have to. We ought to be able to put K-Rail or something out there if that's what people really need without any big issues. Place it so that you can still get emergency equipment in and out. I don't know if that, you know... It, I, you know, I just, I worry that we're really getting too detailed in our analysis of this. And, and again, I'm trying to accommodate an event, not trying to over-engineer it and, and actually prevent a successful event, I guess. So, you know, the, the answer is do nothing and it'll occur fine if we didn't do anything out there. And, and if they want to make it a little better, let's make it a little better without really worrying about it too much. I think we're, I think we're just over-analyzing this one. I really do. Public communications are closed. Oh. Uh, no, the first public communications were for business, city business. So this isn't a public hearing. This is an agenda item. I'm not opposed to letting him talk. But. We will have public comments in, uh, at the end as well. I, I do get concerned. It sounds like there are a lot of um, obstacles to, if I understood you correctly, we'd have to study the traffic counts for this event, which means that we wouldn't even be able to do anything until next year, potentially. Um, I know the original issue, Scott, that you and your group brought forward was the inconvenience 1100. Um, I get, I'm sorry, safety. I, I get very concerned about the 1200 block and the 1100 block, but I, I think more, I'm sorry about the, just the 1200 block and given everything that's happened in the last few years, it's just too easy if someone wanted to do something malicious with that area. So I, I think it would be prudent to at least consider vehicles or something else that's not gonna be overly inconvenient. Um, and I don't, I don't, I can't even come up with a solution for the 1100 block based on what you said. But um, I guess I'm a little frustrated that it's so difficult to address the inconvenience for the residents on the 1100 block. I understand the constraints, but it's frustrating to hear that and not know that we can't do something. Um, the 1200 block seems e obvious to me that we got to put some vehicles in place. That's my own thought on that. Um, but I don't know, Mike, Suzanne. Don? Yeah, I, I uh, would like to support the uh, Traffic Safety Committee's recommendation to reject the request. They've given it good study. I, I haven't been able to establish that it's, it's a problem that needs to be fixed based upon the record of the last uh, 50 or 60 years. So I think we'll be all right.
sorry. One thing to add that we didn't bring up, at least for the, uh, the parking issue. I know that our sergeant, uh, we've asked our sergeant to meet with the property owner at 1700 East Walnut. There's a six story parking structure. And we've asked uh, if they would be willing to even open it up for $5 a day up to them and to try to ease the parking issue because everyone, no one has a place to park. If they are agreeable to that, we can even put signs up, you know, or because we have uh, message boards that there's event parking that maybe direct them to there because it's not that far away from the event. And so uh, we thought about it. We, there was uh, an attempt to make contact today. We'll follow up tomorrow. We'll follow up next week to see if we can at least do that to try to mitigate some of this traffic that's, that's uh, driving around in our neighborhoods and direct them to a place where they can park. If they're isn't, amenable isn't to it. Isn't that the same parking garage that's basically screwed up the whole east side of town along Washington and on and on and on? Well, that's, they're that's the ones, the yes, the they're the ones that were charging their employees to park and their employees were, which really kind of forced the issue for permit parking. But, uh, you know, they're there to make a buck. So uh, if they're willing to do something for a very small cost, maybe it'll help um, if they're willing to do it. We don't know yet. At least we'll reach out to them. Is there like a hybrid solution where have, I'm sure you considered like not allowing parking in a three or four block radius at all for this event and shuttling people? I know it sounds crazy, but we have a shuttle bus in the city that's very underutilized. And um, it occurs to me that while it might be inconvenient, I mean, I used to live in California, 800 block, and there's no question that this event has an impact on the residents there for sure. Um, and it, it, to your point, it's growing year over year, especially with social media. So I just wonder if there's not some other solution, you know, working with the chamber to encourage people to not park there. And parking is such an issue. Like if you l prevented people from parking within a three or four block radius, are they still going to walk? Maybe they would, I suppose. Or they'd park there and get the ticket, you know, so it's cheaper for that. I don't know. It's really hard to say. Um, if we did that, we haven't thought about it. It just eliminates a lot of parking for people, parking for residents, and I don't know if they're really going to go for that. We'd have to post it for everyone. Right. No, I'm thinking more like a temporary permit parking situation for the residents, similar to what we had in place permanently on California Street and the surrounding blocks. You have to ha hang this because also going two, three blocks, I mean, it affects your parking in front of your place. There's no question. People keep parking down the blocks and it's less space for you in front of your home. I think that's a great idea. I don't know if we're going to be able to do it by the time this starts, because yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of requirements related to getting permit parking. Just like the permit parking that we have in Washington, it pushed the problem west, and then more and more blocks. I agree. I talked to the city manager about shuttles, providing shuttles from somewhere in town, and then our discussion was this isn't a city event, and we set aside, we select a number of events during the year that we partner with so that we don't charge those organizations, usually nonprofits, and this is not one of those, and we haven't set aside the funding for shuttles. What's interesting, though, mm -hmm. I totally agree, is you said it was a block party permit. Like, we would never allow, what is it, two weeks, three weeks, six weeks? We would never allow a six-week block party. So there's the contradiction in, in all of this, I think. It's, um, it ha does have a major impact on the neighbors. I would hope that we'd get a little more creative in some of the possibilities. Well, we can ask the police department and the traffic committee to go, go back. I mean, I appreciate what you've done and the recommendations you, you gave us. Public safety is your profession, so I respect that. Um, and and I thought I heard the mayor pro tem and council member offer to sit out there in cars every night for two weeks <laughs> in a nice big purple 1-800 got junk. So, <clears throat> so I don't know, Ken, I mean, Ken and Captain. I, I hope we can reconsider the blocks that surround it because it is becoming a nuisance having lived there firsthand. 800 block. In fact, that's how I found the house that I moved into, is walking about three blocks away down to Candy Cane Lane, see a house for rent, move in there years ago. And then when I moved in there, I realized, man, this, <laughs> this, is, this time of year, this is really problematic. Yeah. Um, and then I don't think we've addressed the 1,200 block. I think we ought to consider vehicles 
or something, even if there is a cost to the city. Okay. We're, we'll we'll definitely do something um, along those lines. Yeah. It's all horse barricades. Well, they have barricades. It's been working for 60 years, so I, mean, I guess, you know, the, we, we have a do-nothing option that we're not. <laughs> yeah, the horse, I get it, the, what are those called, the Type 3? The saw horse. Yeah. yeah. This wooden horse. But if someone wants to do damage. It could be someone intentionally coming through. It could be someone unintentionally coming through. Right. It could be a number of things. You know, 99.9% .9 of the time, I think nothing's going to happen. Um, however... Never know. They didn't know that someone was going to New York go plow through people, you know, uh, riding bikes. You just don't know when it's going to happen, why it's going to happen, what their motives are, or not have any motives. It could be a medical emergency. We just don't know. Um, but I do think the prudent thing is in the future, there's got to be something a little more long term. Um, in this case, I think we can get creative and come up with something, even if we have to park a police officer out there with three cars to block the street, you know, for the hours, you know, it's for 19 days, I think. And we'll do something. No, I, I think we need to do something. As far as the sawhorses, for years, my neighbors and I had block parties for the 4th of July, and the sawhorses don't stop anybody. I mean, they're like anything. They stop the people who follow the law, and they don't stop the people who think it doesn't apply to them. Yeah, and it's convenient for the people on the street because when they want to leave, they can go and move it and put it back. Um, in this case, we'd have to have someone there to actually move out of the way and then put it back. It'll be a physical vehicle. But we're going to come up with something. Okay. So it sounds like we're going to have vehicles parked on, for the 1200 block. We're going to have, well, we're going to make every effort to put our cars and staff it in some way. And uh, I'll work with uh, Ken and see if it can be a collaborative effort, maybe through uh, Public Works and the police. Is that something, something cadets can do? Um, we're going to look at every option. Every option. What? Would a police officer being out there on the 1100 block just monitoring? Because I don't recall if it's probably not something that we actively patrol, right? The Candy Cane Lane. Oh, no, we do not assign an officer right. there. In opening night, we have officers in the area. We have RSVPs that are out there stationed. Um, but we do not have an officer assigned to that. Um, however, in light of our conversation today, um, we're going to do something. Um, hopefully, we'll have a non-sworn person out there because that's kind of overkill. But uh, if we can get a cadet, if we can get uh, an RSVP, we'll do everything. And if we can't, I'll, I'll try to reach out with Ken and see what we can do um, with the street department so that we have someone out there can move things. Parks and Recs, too? Everyone, Everybody. including you, by the way, sir. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. I was thinking Kiwanis might want to be involved <laughs> in something like this. But. I, I, heard, I heard Kiwanis wants to do it. <laughs> So it, it does sound like council is willing to authorize staff to um, make some appropriate expenditures for safety-related reasons for this event. But that yes. will involve some additional overtime. Um, we can develop a budget for the installation of bollards for future years. We can bring that back to council maybe with mid-year budget so you can take a look at that number and if we want to make that, that decision in the future. But I know in, in talking to the chief, he was becoming concerned with this event and the size of it. and at least parking, having some additional resources, including park vehicles out there on the, the busiest evenings as a plan. Yes. I think the expenditure fits, and we're talking about public safety as our first priority, first and foremost, but we're also talking about champion and economic development, and Candy Cane Lane represents the city really well. I mean, it is like Mayberry when you go down there. So, um, And I think it would be irresponsible not to ignore the the major risk that we have with all those people. I mean, how many how many people are we talking about go through there? Do we have any estimates? Yeah, 10,000 people in a six-week period? That's a lot of people. Two-week two week period. You said six. I thought yeah. I heard six the out tenth. there. But yeah. No, the 10th through the 24th. Starts tomorrow. Or the <laughs> So we can get enforcement out there, Chief? Sure. Anytime someone calls the police, we'll roll. Um, if there was a call for service, uh, off the top of my head, I didn't have the numbers in front of me. I know there wasn't anything in the 1100 block that we can pull up in our in our computer. Uh, and in our system, we didn't uh, pull up any calls. 
Thank you. Do you have enough direction to go on? Yeah, we do. Thank you. Reports, city manager. I wanted to echo the reverend's comments about uh, thanking the city employees who will be working on Thanksgiving and, and uh, happy Thanksgiving to all of our city employees. I did want Ken to address one issue related to Vista del Mar. We are going to have some upcoming lane closures and I know traffic on Vista del Mar has been a, a very significant issue lately. You heard from um, Southern California Edison about a month ago that they were planning some um, lane closures in order to replace some of the major steel towers that are deteriorated and uh, Ken has an update. There were going to be some lane closures on Rosecrans. My understanding is that those have been put off until <coughs> later in the year or potentially early next year. So Ken, if you could provide an update. Honorable Mayor, Council Members, I uh, want to just bring to your attention and the public's attention of work that um, Edison has been talking to us about along with Manhattan Beach and Caltrans because it does involve um, Sepulveda Boulevard. Um, at this point, the, the current phase that is permitted and ready to go that they will be starting on Monday, December 4th, uh, and that will last through December 10th, um, is on Vista del Mar between um, Grand and 45th in our city. Um, electronic message board signs have been notifying um, the public uh, traveling public uh, for about at least three weeks now um, at our request bless you and uh, the the work is to replace um, the uh, latticed towers for the transmission lines uh, they are uh, structurally ready for replacement they're on uh, Chevron property but that is the first phase um, we've made sure that uh, really in consideration of our neighbors to the south um, that they had two lanes open northbound in that area um, from 7 to 9 a.m. So the one lane, it will be reduced to one lane northbound at 9 a.m. and after. Um, at first they came in with, with one lane at the prime rush hour, and we said that would not be a good idea given we know what happened when uh, the other areas were, were impacted by that. So that is coming. There are There are other... Phases, as uh, as Greg mentioned, and we are working with them uh, right now. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, the the next phase that uh, we will continually uh, come to you and the public and and make sure everybody is notified of these um, road closures that are coming. This next one for west of Sepulveda on Rosecrans um, is in the final processes really with uh, Edison negotiating with Caltrans on what their permit requirements are. Um, so we can have those to make sure everything's squared away and issue our permit as well and be able to notify folks exactly what's going on. So uh, thank you. Is that all city manager, city attorney? I have nothing this evening, thank you. City clerk? Nothing this evening. So we heard from our city treasurer earlier. Councilmember Brand. I'd like to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving this week. Hope you have a great one. Sounds like it'll be a warm one around here. Maybe record setting. And then uh, remind everybody about the uh, holiday tree lighting uh, coming up on Saturday, December 2nd. This time uh, from 1 to 6 p.m. and down in Library Park, breaking with our typical tree lighting. So love to see everybody there and uh, just as a heads up uh, under the item under the mayor's name related to the lakes I'm going to be making some comments around top golf and uh, so everybody have a chance to uh, take a seat and uh, get your seat belts on thank you thank you council member do you good pass Mayor Pro Tem Boyles. I'll pass. All right, let's see. So I do have an item under my name. Consideration and possible action to provide direction to the Lakes Task Force related to acceptable future uses to consider with the request for proposal for the lakes at the El Segundo Golf Course. Fiscal impact none. Um, 
I had a staff report, a very brief one written up, and my concern is we are putting together a committee of different committees and people and staff to come up with ideas for the golf course, and I'm concerned that we don't have the money to do everything. So I had talked about going forward with just quotes for a golf course as opposed to other things. But in the next two years, we're looking at $10 million of unfunded pension liability that we're responsible for, and I think it's only going to grow. So I wanted to talk about with the, the council about some constraints of how much money we're going to spend on that or what sort of constraints we're going to put on it and also to see if those schedules can be pulled to the left at all for the RFP process. But my major concern was giving realistic expectations to this committee of staff and volunteers who will be working on it. So I think we need to give the committee uh, a deadline to get back to us. I suggested last talk, time around this, the end of January or the end of February. Uh, it's hard to get anything done this month or next month, I should say. Uh, and I, I'm wondering, is the committee selected specifically? We know the kinds of reps, but uh, do we know who got those seats? Or is that still in process? I'd say we're 75 percent of the way there. Okay. Um, yes. And the I also Rec and Parks Commission, the <coughs> Golf Committee have selected their reps. The Planning Commission is scheduled to select their rep on November 30th. Um, Economic Development Advisory Council. Um, we need to get a, probably a special meeting if they're going to have a selected rep. Um, if they're not able to meet in time, maybe the chairman fills that role. Um, well, Chevron has indicated they'll send a yeah. rep like I'd requested, and and um, that could be the EDAC uh, representative also. And I was also going to ask for the next agenda to add an item to have council member representatives. At the last meeting, we agreed not to do that. There were three of us who wanted to serve on it, myself, council member Dugan, and council member Perstuck, but So we decided to not do any, but I would be willing to step aside and have council member Dugan and council member Perstuck be on that committee. So we can't make that decision now. That ha would have to go on the next one. But that's to answer your question about do we have our committee formed. Right. And why do we want council members on it? Because it's all going to come back here to us anyway. Well, we have council members on a lot of our committees and commissions or who represent or attend. Mm -hmm. so, True. And those two council members I mentioned are on the golf committee. And the golf, the golf subcommittee, they selected uh, their representative. Yeah, John Goot was the selected. Good choice. Um, okay. And Mike, my back was to you when I was talking, but do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I guess that would be next, the next agenda. Yeah, as far as the mind. discussion on the... Uh, the council members. The council members, that, that should wait till the next meeting. Okay. That's agendized. Mm -hmm. But there, there is this, you know, you had comments about the funding available and other things. So there, there are some, there's some guidance that we need to give that committee to look at. So some, some boundaries and some, some deadlines and I agree with all of that. So. Mayor Pro Tem. Well, <clears throat> I definitely agree. We need to give them some guidance, whether or not council members are on it. I don't see the need as I expressed last time, but I, I'm open to that. Most importantly, we need some success criteria to be to, uh, criteria to be defined, like what is the capital required from the city, ideally zero or minimal. How many else are going to re residents are going to benefit on an active basis from this asset? Is it considered a recreation facility? Yes or no, and if so, to what extent? Is there green space available with this project? Is there a recurring financial impact, i.e. cash flow element to this project? What is the project risk or track record of whoever the proposed party is? All those things, I think, should be decided upon well in advance by this group 
so that whatever that task force is understands how we're going to define success. Because if we've done our job well and right, we define the success criteria, they do the research of viable options, they collect the responses, they disseminate that information back to us, and we make the decision. But we have to be very clear that we're all on the same page with the, what the success criteria are. And I don't believe one of them is that we, it only has to be a golf course, which is a status quo. So I think that was part of the staff report that I read. Are you, we pull in that item specifically and saying let's get clear about what the success criteria is or I, I agree with your success criteria and that's something that could also be on the next agenda but I think we need to have something we need to again pull it into the left on the schedule and not go forever and we need to give direction and expectations so that this committee knows what we're expecting them to work on and what their deliverable to us is Okay, and I think as I've expressed before, if we're just going with more of the same, in other words, another golf course management company, that would be reasonable to expect that they could reply in 45 to 60 days to an RFP. But if we're going to get more creative and explore all possibilities for this incredible land that's been granted to us by Chevron with really only one restriction that remains recreation, then I think we need to allow more time because no one is going to be able to do the research, collect the information, build a financial model within 45 to 60 days for a new use of the facility, which would require probably capital investment, et cetera. So while I think it would be great to move the timing up, I don't know why we're in such a hurry to do it after five and a half years. And this is an incredible opportunity we have for us, for the citizens of El Segundo, for many years to come, we're talking about signing potentially long-term leases, and I would not want to hurry this decision. I think we need to be responsible and good fiduciaries and set this thing up with the right framework from the beginning. Well, I think, you know, we've spent the better part of six years neglecting uh, the lakes clubhouse, the restaurant, the golf shop, et cetera. And Top Golf didn't make it here. It lost on a 3-2 vote a couple of months ago. And so we need to, to get back to taking care of the lakes and uh, making it uh, more profitable and uh, giving it some resources to work with that it's been uh, denied for so long. And uh, I want to, at the end of the day, end up with uh, our local golf course, our local nine-hole golf course. I think it's very much appreciated by many, and it's uh, nice that we have that kind of space in such an urban setting as uh, we live in here in the South Bay. So isn't there a allowance on the agenda tonight to set a deadline for this committee to uh, come back to us with, with their report? Can't they get this done in 60 days? This, this item doesn't have a deadline on it, Dr. Brown. It says discuss limiting the range of possible future use, land uses that would be accepted through the request for proposal process or alternatively discuss and take other action related to this item. Mayor, we, we provided two optional schedules in the, the last discussion here, and you, you directed us to use the more aggressive or, or expedient schedule, which had, I believe, the task force reporting to council late January, early February with, with a, a draft of what they were going, of their recommendation. But I believe we generally have a timeline that, okay. that we're going to be working from. Thanks for that reminder. That, that sounds adequate to me. Just a question for council since um, obviously my office would work closely with the city manager and staff on preparing whatever paperwork um, or working with the subcommittee, um, legal issues and whatnot relating to the RFP or contracts. And I, if the council's expectation is that this will be done by the beginning of April, given the current direction and timelines, I, I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that, that, that there's, I'm not saying it couldn't, but with the current 
schedule, it, it's pretty improbable. Um, I think that this would have to be expedited even more than what the schedule that uh, the city manager referred to. And even then, I, I think it's, it's a difficult task. Again, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I, that's the expectation. I, I, I'm not, not, I guess that's my question. What is the expectation about when, when, this, when the council wants is done and what does it mean by being done, just so that we're, I don't want to walk away from here being unclear. Well, the original expectation or the dates that the city manager just reminded us of. Yeah. Um, and I would like more scope and expectations of what we're asking the committee to do and what we as a city think we can do. And do we not want another land lease on some of the most valuable land in Southern California? I think we need to discuss that too. I agree we don't know what the options are, but they're not inventing more land, and if there ever is residential east of Sepulveda, there's no green space over there. So, to protect that. So, the proposal, the, the proposed schedule that we had worked out was an aggressive one, had responses back early April. So, the unknown that I think that Mark is referring to is okay, we get these responses, then what? Do we understand them? Do we want to negotiate with them? Do they need further clarification? There are a number of points along the way where this timeline could potentially create a delay. Um, but we can get an RFP out and, and we can get responses, we think, by, by that April <coughs> schedule. We just don't know how clear or how satisfied the council is going to be with those responses. Right, and I don't think we can make that decision and everybody chime in until we get them and see what it is we have. We could say we're going to ask for more information or not, or we're going to choose one to negotiate with or not, but we don't know until we get the, the responses. So perhaps the next meeting, some of these issues can be further refined and whatnot. Again, I'm not, whatever the council policy is, it is. I just want to make sure that the expectations of what council has for my office that I'm meeting those and just want to make sure that that's clear. And I think we owe that to you and your office. And Council Member Perstek will be back for that meeting so she can contribute. And I'm Council here to serve you. I just make sure that I uh, just want to meet your expectations. Council Member Dugan, any thoughts? Yeah, I'm just, you know, I think. We talk about what are, you know, you need to have the success criteria established for what we want that that facility to become in the future here. So I agree with that. That's the direction that we have to give the committee. I think that, um, you know, you, if I look back at the history of that place, it was, you know, granted property to us. The decision was made to put a golf course there. The decision was made to make it an enterprise fund. Those were all things that were done in the past, and now we've you know we've got this golf course there. The the enterprise fund actually, I guess you know there's 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 a loan that was paid off by the city, so there there is no outside debt. There's an internal note of debt to the city here. I think that's something that we need to discuss going forward. Also, I think we have some parks and rec green space there that currently has the I think it has the ability and I think it does pay its own way going forward. The only people that the only time you talk about a debt issue is when people try to talk about repaying the loan that was taken out to to construct the place in, originally here and and you know and I struggle with hey you know the people in front of us decided to do this took a plan of attack they built it they it's been operated and and going forward, it's like, hey, maybe maybe that didn't work out the way everybody wanted it to be, but right now it's it's owned free and clear by the city, and it, it had its own way of paying for itself going forward, and it's become a, a facility that's utilized by a lot of people, El Segundo residents, myself included, and, and people from the South Bay in the community, and it does pay its way going forward. So when we talk about success criteria, going forward this thing is you know it 
It's not a prime piece of real estate that's going to be going into the hands of the developer. And in my opinion, I mean, that's what, that's kind of what, what I, I'm kind of reading into what people are trying to get out of this place when it's actually a, a, a facility that currently pays its own way going forward. And I think that's the only parks and recs facility that we have that does that. So I'm, I'm encouraged by that. So when we talk about success criteria, we need to get into what is, what is it we're really looking for for our success criteria and, and give some direction to the committees and and I'd love to work with them uh, you know we can work with them whether I'm formally on it or not we have John Goots uh, representing the golf committee and there's plenty of people out there that are willing to help make this place uh, successful make it better so I, I'm encouraged by all of that and what is required to make it not an enterprise fund just to make it a parks and rec facility that's a council policy decision um, doesn't have to be price fund it's just been set up that way we move it into the park and rec in a policy issue maybe that's another discussion yeah well that's part of success <clears throat> criteria going forward so I think the reason it was probably put in the enterprise fund, if I had to guess why it was set up that way, the spirit of that was so that there was accountability to the project specifically and the funds that were borrowed from the city were paid back. So let's not forget that either, that history either. And one of the things that got me on this path is that I was looking to see how much it would cost to turn, I, I know it was a suggestion you made, it's not, necessarily where you want to go but you said to use that as recreation and parks land for fields maybe so I asked for data how much it costs to to turn the land over at campus into fields and it was about five million dollars it was separate five to purchase about five to purchase the land and then another five to do it in 2006 Meredith about 11 years ago and costs going up and greater space so I started to see how much it was going to cost to do something like that and I it looked cost prohibitive which is one of the reasons you know to give direction to come up with success criteria what it is that we're looking for if it were to be something else or to remain a golf course but you know to come up with a project that's 50 million dollars I don't think we have 50 million dollars to spend on fields Mayor, it just one clarification um, that I think is important. Yes. We have about $14 million worth of equipment in the city. We have about $11 million set aside for equipment replacement. And five or six million of that is, is a note, is a loan from the equipment replacement fund to the golf course. So that's, those are real dollars when mm -hmm. it comes to that, that fund. And if the enterprise fund went away, that loan would go away and, and equipment replacement. Well, it's a paper Which accounting. Note it, it it does affect that fund. Thank you. So, should we move this to the next meeting? Continue this and come up with some success criteria. And Council Member Perstek will be back and talk about having council representation, so that we have something to give to the the committee that we're asking to deliver something back to us. Yeah, I just want to clarify one point. Mm -hmm. I would never suggest any option that would re require substantial capital from the city. I mean, just this week I was up in Sacramento talking about the dire situation the city's going to be in in the foreseeable future. So I just want to be on record to say that that was never something I considered. Any option that we consider, including a new management company, would require probably 2 to $3 million minimum of capital. We heard that from our last study. And then if you want to put lights in, that's on top of that. So whoever takes us on is going to put capital in. There are a myriad of potential options out there. The more we compress the timeline, the more we're going to get more of what we already have. And the more that we open up the timeline, the more that we're going to get creative, potentially viable options that are going to benefit the majority of our citizens, not just 10% of our El Segundo residents on a regular basis. I think we need to be very careful about how we choose to use this asset that we have that is a unique opportunity. We do not get these every day. And if you look at the school board, how long did they take to consider the DR Horton options? 
Okay, they took a long time then. 76, 24, that's a long time. Well, that's not comparable. For I'm, years. I'm only suggesting yeah. that this is a very unique asset that we have available to us, and we should not rush this decision. We've already spent five and a half years. Yes, I'll just say for the school property, though, for years, they tried to get somebody to go in and build assisted living, and that turned out to not be viable. So then they went to D.R. Horton. Right. Then they cast the net wider because they weren't specific with one potential type of option, and then they got something that was economically viable. I'm suggesting the same. Except they shouldn't have sold it at all. <laughs> Made some real money on it by putting kids back in it. Okay. Thank you. So I have some things to say. Um, first, I, thank you for reminding me, Drew. You didn't say it, but I want to thank you and Joe for going to Sacramento last week for the CalPERS issue that's statewide. And I, Dr. Brand and the Mayor Pro Tem are on a subcommittee here with all the bargaining units. But thank you for going up. And I saw you quoted in at least one article that had to do with that, that meeting. So thank you. Thank you, Joe. Joe Lilio. Okay, let's see. Um, so since we last met, Dr. Bran, Greg, Barbara Voss, Dr. Melissa Moore, Susan Acevedo from the school district, Councilmember Perstak and I attended the first day of Wiseburn Da Vinci High Schools in El Segundo. And it was a really wonderful day with a thousand high school students, maybe. 1500 and um, what a school I encourage everybody to stop by I think the grand opening is December 9th and I think everybody should attend it because it is like anything or nothing you have ever seen before and I'm sorry the chiefs were there and a couple of police officers because you know there was some traffic issues the first day but they're all being worked out so it was um, a wonderful day for Wiseburn and a wonderful day for El Segundo and again I encourage everybody to go to the grand opening. I attended the Los Angeles County Vector Control, the COG Steering Committee, um, the city manager and I met with the new representative from Metro along with Kobe King to talk about some issues and items and ideas we have for El Segundo to get transportation going, well, I think. Most of us attended the Mattel mixer, the chamber mixer, which was really wonderful. Thank you, Mattel, for hosting that. A special part of the evening was they unveiled the Centennial Barbie and the Centennial Hot Wheels, which are gorgeous. And we are going to have them come to the council meeting also to unveil them. They're really wonderful mementos for our 100 years here. And along, let's see, with Dr. Bran, I attended the opening of the USO at the MEPS facility on Grand Avenue, which is um, a wonderful addition to that facility. We have the largest MEPS in the country by volume, not necessarily by footage, and that the MEPS is the Military Entrance Processing Center, where the people who volunteer to serve in the military go there for processing. I attended the Pacific Swing Line concert at the library this weekend, which was very entertaining and was well attended. And several of us attended the Chambers Government Affairs Council. And oh, I was also invited this past week to have lunch at the Air Force Base by Colonel Roberts. And we went to um, two areas there. So it was great to see all the people who serve our country and to be able to um, wish them a happy Thanksgiving. Like, I wish each of you a happy and a blessed Thanksgiving. And with that, we hey, will go. Mayor, yes, sir. I, I had asked to promise to make a statement around Top Golf. Oh, yes, sir. And uh, I wanted to let you finish your oh, okay. report. Yes, sir. Fitting that it be around the item on the lakes. So, everybody here sitting down. I already warned the folks at home. On October 3rd here, we had uh, a vote on Top Golf that uh, most people are aware of. And this is coming after five and a half years of uh, the issue going back and forth and environmental impact reports and et cetera. 
and uh, the vote came down three to two against the proposal. And I'm not sure anybody took the time to listen to what I had to say that night about why I voted no. It wasn't because of anybody else up here and how they voted. It was based uh, strictly on my own individual resource uh, research in uh, Roseville, the only top golf facility in California, and uh, here at the lakes. And if you uh, remember, I talked about uh, the fit. I talked about the compatibility of Top Golf immediately adjacent to the lakes, and how I came to the conclusion that it wouldn't be uh, a good fit. Uh, they wouldn't be able to peacefully coexist, and that's what I based my vote on. So that was all there was to that, and um, I know a lot of people have been buzzing about that ever since, but at least we got a verdict that night. Uh, now, having said all that, you've seen all that, uh, I would like to see if there's some way we can bring Top Golf to El Segundo, because Top Golf is a very uh, well-run company. It's a cash cow. It has great professional development for its employees. It provides many, many jobs. It's really hard to, to go against that. And it, it uses great customer service in its approach. So I was very impressed with uh, uh, their effort. And I know it could be successful here in El Segundo. And so what I'd like to ask staff to do is to identify other places in El Segundo where Top Golf could locate. They're really better in a, in a more isolated setting than uh, it, it wouldn't have, uh, that's some of my troubles was putting it right to the uh, south of the lakes. Um, at the same time I see the, say this, there's perhaps four, five, six places we could look at and see what the advantages and disadvantages uh, would be for each of those sites. There's quite a bit of land, for example, uh, just east of the lakes. Uh, it's uh, on the Raytheon property. You'll, you see there from an aerial photograph, got a pretty big one over there on the wall, uh, or driving around in your car that there's uh, baseball, diamonds, sports fields. You never see anybody on them, really. Uh, and there's much other land there in that complex. And... Uh, I'd like for that to be looked at. Raytheon came here, I guess it was in 2015, before I got back here, and they uh, made a proposal uh, to do a retail center along El Segundo Boulevard. They got lots of entitlements uh, from the city council. Uh, many people feel they got away with murder in how... Uh, little they gave up for that. Uh, but during that uh, discussion, they promised to provide in the future land for a park for the city of El Segundo. I can't remember if it was uh, four, six, or eight acres. Uh, they also promised to be better corporate citizens, but they didn't. They basically deceived the council promised to be a better corporate citizens, and uh, they have not lived up to that. They, they say their two main uh, themes for support are veterans and STEM education. We went to a really nice uh, salute to the military uh, a couple of weeks ago at Northrop. I sat at the Boeing table there wasn't a table for Raytheon. They weren't in the program. They didn't support that event. And that was all about veterans and our military. I called up uh, the developer uh, at uh, Da Vinci Schools and asked, what's Raytheon doing for Da Vinci uh, in the last five years? Zero. STEM education now moved in about a block and a half from the main campus of Raytheon. So Raytheon has struggled here. They have not been able to come through on their promises. They don't have a public relations person in California. You find a person in Texas. That's as close as it is. 
It's not like Chevron. It's not like Boeing. It's not like Northrop. So to give some, this land now rather than later to the city that we could turn around and uh, uh, work with Top Golf on would be a good start on Raytheon becoming that better corporate citizen that they promised to be. So my hope is that we can find a way to bring Top Golf, after all, to El Segundo, just in a different space. Because now you know, if you didn't hear before, what my problems with them were, and it wasn't really related so much to them. Uh, it was just, it's not going to fit for me from what I saw uh, next to the lakes. And, and I love the lakes, and I want to make it work better. Like Mike Dugan says, I have the same goals for that. But I, I want top lakes or top golf also and uh, see if we can find a way to get through that that doesn't take five and a half years. So ready for any questions on that when you get your chance or just want the whole public to know. Happy Thanksgiving again. Okay, with that, we'll go back to public communications. I am Val Smith, 1042 East Imperial Avenue, and I was home watching the City Council as I do every meeting that I can make at home watching. I live right at Center and Imperial, and um, I moved here from Atlanta, and most of the time I think I live in Mayberry, as people refer to it, especially coming from Atlanta. But Candy Cane Lane is really a nightmare, even living around the corner. And what I came here tonight to ask for was more police presence that I've seen before. Because um, people come into that neighborhood, first of all, parking's a nightmare. Um, I don't have any space to park, but that just comes with the territory where I live. But um, just more, it's, I guess what's scared me is that it's such a crazy world right now that Meetings of people like that can really occur with somebody crazy. And so I just hope that the police are there and patrolling, whether they're barricades or not. Um, I just would like more of a police presence. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. <clears throat> Scott Nickel, 1124 East Acacia. Um, couple things. I'm going to start with a couple questions. I know you guys, you guys can't answer them until public communication is done, but I wanted to know if any public comment if staff could answer a question or not and practice generally is after the public's done speaking that you know, the council responds or they ask us to respond um, it's council's call as to how they want to conduct the meeting well let's see what the questions are if it could be answered after awesome it's closed or um <clears throat> I spent about an hour and a half going door to door after speaking with uh, mr. Berkman last Thursday night um, in regards to the traffic committees um, recommendation for denial and uh, after he told me hey well if you have 55% of the residents that would be affected you know then you have you know grounds so uh, in an hour and a half I got 15 signatures and as you know going door to door nobody just signs it and says hey I'll see ya right so it's 10 minutes at each door talking about this and uh, I asked people to come tonight to speak so that the five of you well, Carol's not here so the four of you could hear from the horse's mouth the people that pick up the trash every morning following Candy Cane Lane, people that have called the police department, asked for help, and have not been helped, right? The people that have uh, incurred property damage based upon the crowds to the point where, I mean, we are a community, right? So what are we doing from a community standpoint? Some of the people that couldn't make it sent me emails and asked that I please share it with you. So I forwarded those emails to Tracy right awesome so you guys got them I just didn't know if they actually made them to you or not because I wanted to be able to tell the people that yes you saw them you know you know their feelings since they're not here um, do, 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 do. Uh, a couple of them referenced calling the police numerous times in those emails and in some of the text messages Kathy Rutledge tonight was like you make sure that they know I called the cops three times one night last year and they never came out now I understand that there are no police reports of this but I mean do I think Kathy Rutledge is lying to me when she says she called the police three times? I don't, you know, so I don't know where the gap is there. Um, I was a little disappointed. This was my first experience working with the traffic committee and submitting a request. Um, I was surprised that 
as the applicant, I was not involved in the process. It was, it was my conversation with uh, the public works director was, well, we weren't a fan of uh, eliminating any of the parking and you're going to eliminate parking. And I was like, whoa, sorry, there must be some confusion, but no parking is being eliminated whatsoever. And it was like, oh, well, and it's like, well, gee, if, if the applicant was involved in that process, there could be a question and answer. There could be a, well, why are you asking for this? You know, or like, hey, you know, resident, this is why we can't do this because of A, B, and C, but hey, maybe we can do this. Because there's no one's going to make a request to the traffic committee unless there's an issue, right? We're, not, we're asking the public, see something, say something, right? So we saw something. We said something. And, you know, I feel like a lot of, I could go on and on about the conflicting reasoning in that decision-making process, but the nuts and bolts of it is there's a safety concern on the 1100 block, a safety concern. We'll continue to pick up the trash the next morning. We'll continue to be inconvenienced with parking. We'll have people block our driveways and we'll wait till they come to move their car, right? We understand that when we moved in, right? But coming before the city and saying, hey, you guys don't live there. You're not seeing this. Like it is a disaster. You know, we, we have to get involved from a city standpoint. We have to. Acacia Center is not a four-way stop. It's not a four-way stop. So when you have people trying to make left-hand turns to go eastbound on Acacia during that time, and it's bumper to bumper, you now have a car stopped in the center of Center Street with no stop sign for the northbound traffic on Center. Right? So you can imagine. Um, I feel like we should be uh, preventing, not reacting. Right? Offer some real solutions. I understand that it's do studies and understand how many cars go by. And the difference in the, it's like, just go down there and look, you know, go down there and look. And, um, I was also a little disappointed that there's no residents on the traffic committee. You know, I get it. It's staff members. It's people that are trained in this or police officers. But when it comes down to it, like, why is there not a resident saying, oh, does that make sense? Like that, that seems to make sense. Something practical. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. oh, and the other question was opening night, the 1100 block is closed. No one ever, well, we're never notified of that. No one on the 1100 block pulls that permit. So is that a city thing that gets done or is that part of the block party? And I guess that's it. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and council members for allowing me to speak. And I apologize for making comments from the audience. But I feel very passionate about this. My name is Teresa Lanfear Ames. I live at 1127 East Acacia. I'm very familiar with El Segundo. I'm a native. I've been going to Candy Cane Lane since I was probably five. And I actually think it started before 1969. But for those of you that you know, don't know, I'm 57. So I think I've been going to Candy Cane Lane for 50 years. And we would drive down the street. And it was quaint and wonderful, and I love El Segundo. It's my hometown. And we have lived in our house for 13 years, and I was thrilled to buy a house on East Acacia. So excited about Candy Cane Lane. My husband's not from El Segundo, and he had no idea that we had to step it up, decorate, and be ready. We are four houses from California. And, you know, 13 years ago, it was great. But in the last maybe three, four, five years, the, all of the social media has brought the crowds out. I'm a school principal. You know, I don't have any children, but I worry about student safety, children's safety every day. And as our police officers have shared, incidents occur all the time. And we can't wait to be reactive. We see so much traffic. As Scott said, I don't mind that I can't park, we don't have driveways on my side of the street. I don't mind the kids coming up and down, we love that. But we see people walking in the street, we see children darting across the street, we see people parking illegally, they're not watching their children. And I just fear for the day then something tragic occurs and we said, oops, we could have had some police out there or some or volunteers, that's a great idea anything to help manage the crowd. We're not saying stop it. I don't want it to stop. 
But I, I get a little frustrated that the 1200 block is the focus all the time. Because four houses down is my house. And, you know, we don't have a barricade. We don't have any support. And I am very worried that something's going to happen to a child here. And that's going to be the memory that we're going to have for Candy Cane Lane. It's not going to be that we had a big crowd. And families do come, especially with small children, they will come night after night after night because it's a fantastic thing for little kids. So we can't estimate how many thousands of people are there. But I just feel like we need to do, I, I would rather us not spend money. If you guys don't know, my dad was a city treasurer here for years. It's not about spending money. It's not about having a traffic study. It's about can we get some cadets out there? Can we get some RSVPs? Can we get some volunteers? Someone to help just control the traffic, the crowd. Even if you don't want to block our street, the idea was just an idea. We are happy to do something else. We also, on our 1100 block, it's not related to Candy Cane Lane, suffer from lack of parking because California is now permit. And that pushes cars onto our block and people that park from businesses on Imperial, and we don't complain. We don't have permit parking. We should, but we don't. So I just ask you guys, let's be proactive. It doesn't have to be costly, but let's do it as a city, because everyone thinks Candy Cane Lane is a city event. Um, they don't think it's just our little block. Maybe it was when it started, but it is a city event, and I want it to continue, but I don't want something to happen because that will taint it forever, and it will taint El Segundo. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak to you tonight regarding uh, Andy Kane Lane. Uh, my name is Michael Batten. Um, my family and I have lived on East Acacia since 1999. Uh, so very familiar with Candy Cane Lane. It's always been one of the positives for our family. As far as living in El Segundo, we've always enjoyed the celebration, being part of the festivities. When we first moved in, uh, we were one of maybe three or four houses on the 12 1100 block that actually decorated. Now, it's, we're actually competing, I think, with the 1200 block in terms of decorations. Uh, some of the other homeowners have really gone hog wild and not having trouble keeping up. Um, I did call the police last year to report uh, somebody blocking a fire hydrant. It's the first time I've ever called about something for Candy Cane Lane, although I had multiple opportunities before that to do so. But uh, what triggered me was the fact that the person that was blocking the hydrant was also facing the wrong way. It actually crossed over and taken the spot. So I said, that's enough. So I called the police, um, but before uh, we could finish the call, the driver showed up, got in her vehicle, and drove off. Um, in the 17, 18 years that we've been here, um, the crowds have just grown enormously. I can remember when, uh, maybe the weekdays, if they would drop off, the, the crowd. It's like opening night every night now every night. I remember when we go over uh, Christmas Eve, it would be deserted. It's like opening night, Christmas Eve. And it's extended all the way through New Year's. So um, we're dealing with heavy traffic um, both ways, stop and go. So speed's not really the issue. Uh, you have people making U-turns in the middle of the street. That leads to a lot of uh, confrontations can hear it. <laughs> um, the congestion on the sidewalks is, in, is incredible. Um, if somebody opens their car door to get out of their car, it blocks people from walking on the sidewalk. You have congestion on the sidewalks like you do on the streets. Um, so I have really, con my major concern I think is safety. Like Scott pointed out, our emergency vehicle is going to get to the fire hydrant on our block. The cars are all blocking it. The sidewalks are, are all congested. How is a, a, a police car going to respond to a call if they can't make it up the street? Um, an ambulance. 
And about once a month, we have an ambulance come up our street because somebody will have a heart problem or something. How are they going to make it if, if the, the streets are blocked off? Um, I'll finish up by saying that besides the traffic and congestion, I also have personal concerns as a property owner. Liability. My next door neighbor and I actually take turns standing guard out front because the crowds have gotten so huge and the congestion is so great that people are, actually, are, are, are now using the yards, the lawns, to navigate from Candy Cane Lane to their cars. So we, in the last couple of years, have roped off our, our yards with lights to keep but some other people don't. So uh, in the last couple of years, we've actually had people come up on the neighbor's side and trip over wires, extension cords, whatever. And we got concerned about what would happen if somebody got injured, who would they sue? So I have concerns about that. And the trash. I can probably relate to you how the drinking tastes have changed for alcohol over the years. It started off in the, back in the 90s with malt liquor and Mickey, Mickey Big Mouse. Now it's moved up to uh, Jaggermeister and Scotch. That's what I find in my yard every morning, in the, at the empties. So uh, I'm not here to throw any shade on Candy Cane Lane. I think it's a great community event. We always go down there on opening night, walk around, even though we've seen everything every year. We enjoy seeing all our friends from El Segundo and all the people that come out. But um, it's getting huge. It really is. And I think you guys should take notice. Thank you. My name is Suzanne Lance. I live at 1112 East Acacia. And to put George your point, I've lived there since 2009. It was great. And then the guy moved down the street with the big house, decorates for Halloween. I'm sure you've all seen the coffins. He decorates for Christmas. And I don't think people realize that 1100 block isn't Candy Cane Lane. I think we need to include 1100 block as being part of Candy Cane Lane. People don't know that we're not a part of it, and they walk right down the middle of the street. I'm amazed my cat is still alive. I mean, I've been there nine years. I can't believe she's not dead yet. There, nobody stops for anything. I have called the police. You've always come out. You've always come out and ticketed or towed cars in front of my driveway. Always. Every year I call. And I'm not, it's not that. I'm just more worried about the safety. I cannot believe the people just run in the middle of the street. You have to close our street. I do not want a one way. You need to close our street and pretend our street is part of Candy Cane Lane. We have to protect our children. My child, your children, we must protect them. People go to that huge house on our block. And now we all decorate because he decorates and he comes to our houses and decorates our houses with his leftover stuff. So now we're all in a competition. We are. Are we not? He. I, I don't. He gives me his lights. So now our street is Candy Cane Lane Jr. There is no longer just, it stops there. And so what would be ideal is stop it at the end of our street. Stop it at Acacia and California and Acacia and Center. And then everybody can walk. We can also have the cars there and protect people so there are no people who are going to drive their cars and, you know, hurt all of our children. Please close the street. If you need us to, I've even offered to Scott, if you only give us those things you give me for the run for education, which don't work to stop anybody when I'm working my corner, I will use those and I will put them up every night myself. I don't mind. I got my, all my neighbors, we'll all put them up, we'll take them down. I don't care. Do something. Because I don't want to leave that. Okay. Hi hey there, Honorable Mayor. Um, I do apologize for speaking out, but I as well feel very passionate about the situation. Uh, Kimberly Nickel, 
1124 East Acacia, which is adjacent to the 1200 block of Candy Cane Lane. I have been a resident of El Segundo for almost 10 years. My husband is Planning Commissioner Scott Nickel. I'm also a small business owner here in town. We absolutely love Candy Cane Lane. This is not about shutting down Candy Cane Lane. We are passionate about it. We are grateful for it and the efforts from all those people that make it possible. But I'm here to speak on public record. There are issues regarding the safety of our children. Last year, myself and other concerned residents witnessed on different occasions visitors to Candy Cane Lane in wheelchairs going down the center of our street into oncoming traffic because the sidewalks were so crowded that they could not get through. There was also numerous occasions where large strollers that had small children inside were going down the middle of our street into oncoming traffic because the sidewalks were so crowded. On another occasion, my own five-year-old son was almost hit by a car. I was waiting for him to cross the street. My mother was on the other side of the street. We looked both ways, we held hands, we waited for a car to stop, we did it right, and a car sped up to try and get a parking spot and almost hit my son. We are simply trying to come up with a solution for a better flow of traffic, whether it's having a different flow of traffic, closing down the street, we are the only adjacent block. There's two dead ends. There's a cul-de-sac and there's a dead end on um, California. I just ask that you guys review the plan, review the, speak to the traffic committee about it, whatever it may be. Many of the visitors to Candy Cane Lane are not El Segundo residents. Should someone get injured during the weeks of Candy Cane Lane on our city blocks, this community, the city of El Segundo, and its council will be held accountable. Uh, Michael Palillo, Palillo sing it properly. Uh, I live, this is an email from another resident, 1103 East Acacia. Uh, sorry, I just noticed a letter on my porch. Wish I'd known I would have come to the council meeting sooner. I call, the police, the, I call the police department every year because our street is a madhouse and an accident waiting to happen. The police department assigns one officer to the first few hours and on the first night of opening night, and that's it. They don't make sure the barricades are in place the next night. We have to do all of that. On the weekends, there are thousands of people with small children and strollers walking down the middle of the street and darting in front of parked cars. There are cars blocking driveways. There are cars making illegal turns. The corner of Acacia and Center becomes a nightmare with zero traffic control. When cars travel on Acacia towards Center Street from California, their headlights blind oncoming traffic because the incline the streets make. This in turn makes it almost impossible to see young children crossing the street. And because some people, oh, I won't go down that road. Um, I have repeatedly asked the police department to send a car down to the corner of center of, of the corner of center and Acacia and have been ignored. The weekend before Christmas is the worst. There are thousands of people with no place to park. The streets are jammed and the sidewalk is completely blocked and people are forced into the streets. It amazes me that our city manager is willing to open up El Segundo to an incident simply because they feel they can't afford to have an officer there on the weekends. God forbid a child gets hit. Okay, see no more public communications. We'll close council comments. I think the, well, quite a few of the residents of that area have spoken. It's clear that there are, I didn't realize that a couple of residents were actually suggesting a closure of 1100 altogether. I, don't I hadn't that. heard that either. I don't remember I that being know. discussed and what the viability of that is and the impact on the surrounding uh, neighborhood. And then I assume 55% of that group would have to approve that as well. I don't know if there's an indication of support. But it has occurred to me the years I've lived here, 20 plus years, that 1,200 block, it has become, it used to be one block, as far as I, long as I can remember, and then it's certainly become two blocks at this point. 
I hadn't heard that option before. And I do share the concerns, having been out there and seeing all of the traffic and the potential liabilities, as I've indicated earlier. So I think police enforcement is a bare minimum. And I think the city ought to fund that. Again, public safety is our biggest, most important endeavor. Also, I would like to see some of those um, cardboard disposable trash cans get set up up and down the streets and then have them picked up in the morning. Maybe have staff go by every morning and empty those. And if closing off the 1100 block of Acacia is not an option, what about putting temporary blinking stop lights at the corner of Acacia and Center? Again, I don't know if that's even a possibility. That's a public safety and public works question. But um, yeah, increased enforcement, have a dedicated officer, evenings, just those hours. Um, is there a certain time that all the lights get turned off? Would the, does, the does the council want to <clears throat> reconsider the direction from earlier or have a, a discussion about this issue? certainly can do that. Um, I don't know how much you want to discuss it further, but you can make a motion to reconsider, and if the majority of you do that, then you can have an open dialogue about it. Make a motion. Yeah, I'll move that we reconsider the decision that we made earlier, or the discussion that we had earlier. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Aye. I'm okay. Aye. Was that an okay? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we got some different information about closing the street, so, pardon? Yes, sorry. So that closing the street, that's not something we looked at, closing a, uh, Acacia at center? To me, that should be studied as a, as a solution here because then it turns the entire area into a pedestrian area like Candy Cane Lane is, and it seems like that would be a lot safer. I realize the parking's gonna, you know, fan out down center and across it and down California south, but you, you didn't consider that option because it wasn't requested, right? So maybe you could have another meeting and look at that. The other thing I love about that is if I want to do something malicious, it's much harder. You know, you could gain speed on, speed on 1100 driving east and ram into people, as we've seen in other places. Santa Monica Promenade, UK, there's been several instances. And that would prevent that from being able to happen unless maybe on California. So I think it would serve several purposes. Ken, that was a strange look you just gave me over there. You didn't like my suggestion, or? Oh no, I'm just waiting if they're through the mayor the opportunity at some point. Uh, if the questions are directly to me, I'd be happy to provide input. And to your earlier point, Mayor Pro Tem, I think that that 55 percent of, of the 1100 block agree to have it closed off as a block party. Scott, have you received 55% of? 14, uh, 55% of the 34 owns um, like But to close it off or just to go one way? That's a whole different. This, is to, this petition is to close it off. Okay. Because my fellow residents, out, um, they out. They <laughs> I tried to not push the problem on Okay, for house. anybody who can't hear, Mr. Nichols is saying that he ha now has a petition to, of his neighbors to get permission to close off the street as opposed to the other one, which was one way. Ken, what are your, can I ask Mr. Berkman, what are your initial thoughts on closing it off? Uh, thank you. Um, through the mayor, there are um, definitely concerns with that uh, above and beyond a one way path of travel and to go back to the very original point that whatever we do here is going to definitely 
cause impacts to adjacent streets. So to speak to the petition amount, which was suggested as a, yes, we have to deny this request for this reason, but similar to our permit parking program to try and say, let's see what we can do if there is indeed support from everybody, in this case, that loop of Acacia Center, Walnut, California, that would be impacted. I'm not sure if that 55% includes all those streets or it's just the 1100 East Acacia. It is a very long block. Um, that's where to the traffic safety committee, that would demonstrate true support of the surrounding communities. And I, we can expect if anything was put in place that in the, in the coming years, Sycamore or further in center or other folks, it, we've seen it with our per permit parking program. So that is just a statement of the fact of the way traffic mitigation measures in place on roadways happen. So let's say it's beyond that. Let's say there is that level of support and we go forward with either a, a new circulation plan or complete closure. The complete closure issues, um, Public Works does not have K-Rail be it the concrete or the um, industrial grade plastic that you fill with water to put in place uh, is one thing. We'd have to get a contract in place to get that. We do have the means in Public Works to place and remove them, uh, you know, place them at around six and remove them at around 10. Um, if uh, police department wants to weigh in the issues that we talked about placing those if you do completely close that street it can impact the emergency response time because pub for, so public works crews would have to be on site all the time certainly that's a let's say a four hour minimum cost of that plus the setup and tear down hours to be there to make sure we could pick up and remove the K rail that's in place for the complete closure to get emergency response teams in there so that's kind of the k -rail option. A different option could be to do what's similar to the, and I, I must correct myself, it's not a block party permit, it's a special event permit. So let's, let's be clear on that. Um, we could put the barricades to do a soft closure, let's say. Um, if that's the case, as Dr. Brand mentioned, if we take away that very long stretch of parking, um, or if there's similar to 1,200 residents that will take ownership of that and move the type three, the softer barricades, and let folks go in and out uh, that are residents so they can have access. That's a possibility. Um, and keep the parking. So that there are a range of options. It's just whatever we do, uh, we need to be fully aware that it, it will spread the problem, problem elsewhere. So. Um, the hard closure, if we remove the parking completely, is really a significant impact. And I was even thinking of blocking off California at Sycamore so that cars don't go down there and try to make a U-turn to come back. Is that the right street? Walnut's the next street oh, south Walnut, of Acacia. I'm sorry, from Walnut to Acacia <clears throat> to block off Walnut there so that there's no place for cars to make a U-turn. They just go straight or... Turn. See these, if I may, these are all great ideas to what is a real issue, and we know that, which is why to go back to what I would recommend we do is to absolutely take these under consideration and with that 55% support, bring the experts in here to help us out with this. Because from our perspective of PD and um, the Traffic Safety Committee, you're taking a situation that is not good and extending it outwards and causing more problems by implementing a solution as it's proposed, be it a closure or the one-way circulation that's proposed. And I don't have an answer as to really impacts. I know it's a long timeline and it seems uh, it's very frustrating the fact that the best way to do this is to really do the counts and understand what is out there regular times and then what happens during the event and we we of course know it's 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 the first thing that pops up on google search when you say look at holiday lights in la we know there's thousands of people but where do they go and how do they travel and what are the real um 
issues out there is something that our traffic consulting firms can do. And, and as you know from our last budget, including um, a special consideration to study Maine and Mariposa and Grand, we, will, we are in the middle of getting, um, considering the proposals that we got for traffic engineering firms as something we could add at a, at a mid-year budget additional money for this study. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, just to speak to the, the police department calls that were unanswered, the, the thing that fire and police department got back to us was specific to the request um, where it was uh, stated that the fire department responded to three people being hit by cars. So those records are the ones that um, when they fire and police searched, they didn't find that. That was, I just wanted to state that. Ken, can I just clarify? So you said 55% of the residents would need to approve a closure if we're going to go down that path, right? Or the one way. Yeah, or the one way. Um, why would it have to require the adjacent blocks? I mean, those, in my experience, just from a practical standpoint, mm -hmm. those people are affected regardless. I mean, the parking goes all the way down California to Washington Park. So I don't know how they'd be inconvenienced from the sense they couldn't go down the 1100 block acacia but that's not easy to do anyway given these hours with the parking and everything else so they probably would be avoiding that that path so i'm struggling what would be the requirement would it be the block of 1100 55 percent approval to do the special event permit for closure or would it be broader than that so the idea for the 55 percent area was was absolutely the for the for the request the two one-way proposed streets of california and acacia when you look at that, if you have that traffic pattern, you kind of get the loop effect of Acacia Center, Walnut, California for folks just cruising, looking for a spot. If I come down south on center, I can't make a left onto Acacia. I'm going to go down to center and say, hey, I can go on Walnut, and then say, all right, California's one. And I'm going to keep doing that until I had enough of trying to find that. I'm either going to park myself and find a spot, um, but not in the weeds that was the reason that we thought of those four streets without the study we don't know if we should include other streets but with council's um direction you know this is not a uh, code mandate i just took it from our preferential parking program okay. and if it's so directed that it's the 1100 block of acacia and california between walnut and acacia then it could be that level of support of council so desires Okay. You know, I'm just sitting here looking at this being a dumb engineer, right? We could put some K rail, you know, close it off the 1100 block of Acacia. I think you have enough people to request it. I have, you know, I fully support that. I could see putting in K rail, staggering them on, on, you know, so let's talk about Center Street going into Acacia put one right at the corner and then stagger one down far enough so you can get a fire engine in there and just close that road to you know local residents only for that period of time from six at night or whatever until 10 at night however you want to do it I could you know we could put a sign out there and make this pretty easy without a lot of study I would think something like that would work you don't have to move the k-rail you can I'm sure you could borrow some from Chevron I'm you know I'll, I'll go out on a limb there with that one I bet you they'd get you some but you could put it out there, place it so you can get your emergency vehicles in and out, close the streets to residents only during this period, and and see what happens. I mean, you know, it's it's a shot at something, but it's not. A, it doesn't take a lot of money. It doesn't take a lot of thought. And I don't. And I hope it addresses people's issues out there. But that's you know, I'm a little bit. You know, I'm I'm be a smart ass now. So go ahead and you can beat me up later on this one, Scotty. But this is something that the residents are doing, and they're throwing the problem onto the laps of the city here, and trying to get support from the city to do something here. And you know, kind of part of me says, let's work together and make this something that we can really work with. But it it shouldn't be a city problem, right? I mean, this is this is something that the residents are doing, and I, and I fully support it, and I like it, but there's an easy solution, and there's easy solutions out there. They're not going to be 100% effective, but they're going to be better than doing nothing. So I would say that we could do something like that very easily and make it happen without a big study, without a lot of work. But I don't know. 
I, again, we're over-engineering this and making it harder than it needs to be. But, uh, Council, I think what you're hearing from staff is in order to understand the impacts before you make the decision, it's appropriate to do the study. You can do something, and we can see what the impacts are and, and learn from that. Um, I think what staff's saying is they think that there are going to be impacts that by addressing the concerns of this block, you're going to upset other people. I've, I've, I've heard there's plenty of impacts already, so we know there's impacts. Yeah. What are we going to do? What can we do to help it mitigate it a little bit? Closing the road, I don't have a close it to local residents only, you know, just people on that street. I don't care. Do, you know, without doing a big study, we can't, we can't just throw money away looking at all this stuff. So sort of three options have been discussed. Do nothing, do a longer term approach in a study or try it and see what happens. If, if that's what council wants to do, we'll, we'll, you know, we, we can make this work. It's going to require the expenditure of some money. I'll require, the, I'll require the, the chiefs and the public works department to track those expenditures. We can report back so that we learn something from this experience and we can decide what to do in future years. I, I think saw horses at the end of the street and a sign like Mike says that says, you know. If you, if you want to put cable in and stagger it, do it. Only get some trash cans out there. And, and we know there's impact with parking permits, there was impact. The blocks that got parking permits to, to Ken's point, it pushed that problem further, and then other neighborhoods applied for, for parking permits. This is a temporary condition, albeit two or three weeks long. So I understand what you're saying, Ken. It's true. It is just going to push the problem, but the traffic will be different because it would be blocked off on two different blocks so that they're people won't be making U-turns and jockeying for parking spaces on those blocks. Um. Real quick, Mike. Yeah. Can, can I just make a motion to move things along? Because I think Mike said what we've been getting to all along, which is let's, let's, I would suggest that we allow them to close 1,100 if they get X percent of, because I think, Scott, even you suggested that you didn't talk to everybody on the block. But if you got, like, the majority of people, in my mind, on 1,100 block to say this is the right idea, then why so, wouldn't so we? So we can handle this like another special event permit. Someone can do that, do that um, survey. Report yep. their results to the city. Can I finish uh, real quick, Greg? Real quick. Yeah. Caveat being, um, I don't think K rails are necessary. I think vehicles are. Have a vehicle there, and the police. We already said police. We want more police enforcement there, right? And that's the responsible thing to do. I think I heard that from a couple people up here. Put vehicles up there, blocking it. Police enforcement as well. And if the 1100 block. Uh, residents circulate that peti petition that you mentioned and get the majority approval then I don't know why we wouldn't approve that and spend the money necessary to protect not only our residents but other people that come here to visit us so I don't I'd know like if you the, were to add something I'd like the 900 block of California as well so that they don't have the option to turn and make you turn yeah. there yeah <clears throat> do something all right so so staff will work with with um an applicant who submits a special event permit and, and will allow them to uh, do this if they get the appropriate number of signatures and we'll um, figure out a barricade plan. Um, I will ask the department heads to track their expenses for this so we can report back to council so that we know what this costs and can plan accordingly in future years. And we have another council meeting before the event as well that you can report back to us yeah. right aren't you the ninth yeah. fire up hard <laughs> closure at center we're not going to do a hard closure at uh, California and Acacia so that means that we're going to have to have two hard closures one at California and Walnut one at center and Acacia and like I said before, we don't have the personnel to be doing that. Um, we have personnel to maybe, maybe do one, and that's going to be a collaborative effort with Public Works and other departments to try and put a vehicle. And so what you're asking for is also closing this off. The residents are going to be stuck in there. 
And it's because we don't want them rolling around with people now walking in the middle of the street because now we're going to restrict them. Um, it's going to be difficult for us to do this new plan. Um, the one at Acacia in California, I think, is manageable. Um, I'm not even guaranteeing we can do that. We can put cars out there, but having staff there to move them at a moment's notice, either for emergency vehicles or for um, residents who want to leave because they have to be able to leave. So, yeah. so uh, again, uh, staggering some K rail out there doesn't really cost a hell of a lot, and it doesn't require us to be out there in in attendance to them. And I think it serves the purpose of shutting that street down for 99% of the people that are out there. And then you can let the residents come in and out and go, and you can get emergency vehicles in and out. So, uh, if I'm hearing correctly, uh, K-Rail without personnel out there to enforce anything? K-Rail without personnel attendant, but responsive to patrolling and, and having a presence out there, just not... A dedicated person out there. I, I don't think we need that. I don't think we've had it in the past, have we? Um, no, we yeah. haven't. But we haven't had K Rail. What I'm, what I anticipate happening is just like any barricade, unless it's a, unless it's a fully manned barricade, they'll go around it. So even let, even K Rail, I understand that I you're. Hear what you, you're saying? Let's give. I just say, give it a try. See what happens. But we can try it. Give it a try. So, we Chief, can, I appreciate what you're saying. Would you talk to Ken and talk to Scott and, you know, we have another meeting to come up with what everybody, the staff thinks is viable. You're the one who's going to enforce it. You are the police department. So we are not public safety subject matter experts, nor are we public works. And the reason I came up so quickly, safety. I'm sorry, the reason I came up so quickly because we're throwing out, let's throw the police at it. And I'm standing back here and said, you know, it's great. We are down staffed and we're at skeleton crews as it is and having to man this and then uh, to be out there all the time. It's going to be very burdensome on we have what we have to patrol the rest of the city. Um, we can do it. We're going to steal from Peter to pay Paul. Um, so if we have three or four cars out, if I have to put one or two cars out. I got one person responsible for the city and that's going to be I think that's dangerous. Well, you had said something about unmarked cars or, Un you know. The, yes, I mean, the, the unmarked yes. cars. We can put unmarked cars out. However, those aren't police officers. We're going to try and, we're going to try and staff it with non-sworn people. And so they don't have the authority to make a stop. They don't have the authority to do anything other than move those cars. And so they can't take enforcement action other than parking tickets. Ken. Um, Madam Mayor, Ken? To, to be clear, I understood or maybe I misunderstood what we're looking to do is uh, what I was calling a soft closure not the K rails but the similar closure that we have at Acacia in California now for the 1200 block do that at Acacia and Center and California and Walnut is that what we're looking at that's what I had suggested I think we'd have to do that if you're gonna yeah. if you're gonna not block, K rail though that's a different not if you're gonna, that, right. if you're gonna block traffic your, at Center and Acacia you'd have to block traffic at uh, Walnut oh, and no, California. I agree. I think we were talking about the, the equipment we were going to use, K-rails versus saw horses that can, can be moved. I, th you know, I think with realistically. Signage that say like residents only. Yes. Pardon? Mayor, I think realistically what we're looking at is doing so soft closures with the exception of where the chief of police feels he needs the hard closures and where he can afford it based on his resources. And we'll authorize the additional budget, but that doesn't create new officers overnight. So. No, it's going, to be up, it's going to be up to the chief of police to decide what he can do and what's reasonable, and it's probably not going to be hard closures every night everywhere. But we, but we can do the soft, soft closure approach and, and see how that works. It should work. And, you know, if you do a soft closure at those locations, it still allows the resident to get out of their car and they can move it if they need to go around it and then put it back. Which happens and now. Some signage yes. that says resident parking only. You can put that. We can do anything like that. Sorry. Go ahead. We've lost control. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't mean to speak at a point. Um, I've sat in your seat in a different capacity. And uh, the one-way thing was, I thought, a compromise between my fellow residents because they've wanted the closure the whole time. And I was like, no, come on. Let's not push it to somebody else. Let's, it's, it was a middle ground. Really, that's not a good idea. 
Okay. So now we've gone to this. I would like to make the suggestion to maybe take the burden off of police that if the weekends, if Friday, Saturday, Sunday are those heavy impacted nights, right? I know my fellow residents are probably just throwing knives at me right now, but if we make a compromise and say, hey, if we can get those soft closures on those weekend nights, and then we'll be able to get some data back on what the cost is, did it help? Because all these people here will gladly come back and tell you in January whether it really helped mitigate the issue or if it didn't do anything, right? These people are not scared to report back to you what we're experiencing on a nightly basis. It's just a suggestion of a compromise that might alleviate this impasse. Yes. What about turning off the lights earlier? Less traffic and the, during the weekday. Um, One more thing, right. please. Sorry, Madam Mayor. Um, to be clear, for the for the applicant, which I'm calling now a, a subsequent applicant application, I guess to the Traffic Safety Committee that we would bring to you in the next council meeting, we're looking um, and and uh, Recreation and Parks Director Meredith Pettit can talk to the special permit. Maybe this is something that is an, a new special permit for that block. I don't I don't know, but for the applicants. Um, East Acacia 1100 block state that this is where we're going of the same mitigation measures as are in place at 1200 Acacia meaning the soft closures with the um, the soft barricades at Acacia and Center and California and Walnut that through that special permit like 1200 block does they the residents take care of that they move it and put it in place um, as they need to and the 55 percent would be the 1100 block of acacia and 12 and, and california from walnut to acacia that's where the 55 percent support would come from i just wanted to make sure for that purpose that's what we are looking to have them come back to us with a request for i'm not sure why we need the california california between we're walnut closing and it, right? sycamore yeah but it, california's closed no it's california not is between it? walnut and acacia so that California between Walnut and Acacia so that people don't turn there, get to the end. No, I understand why we're closing oh. it. I wasn't quite sure why we were soliciting support, but they're, Cause they're trying to have think about the number of homes there. Homes. Yeah, it's yeah. like two or three homes right there. So, okay. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Sorry, I had to understand it. Okay. Well, that was easy. Um. Okay, are we going to close that item now? We can. <clears throat> Pardon? I said it would have been easier in August. <clears throat> yes. But fortunately we have we have one more meeting. Okay, anything else, Council? Okay, this evening. I, I have a thought. I apologize. We have an emergency management coordinator. I don't know what where, where this would reside, but this thing's been going on since sixty something and the last five years it has been an issue. And it took residents from that neighborhood come into us the month before the event so i'm suggesting that maybe i don't know where this resides within the city greg but some kind of risk assessment that was done for the fireworks event that that then led to vehicles being in place that we ought to be thinking about these things on a more regular basis and anticipating this versus this happens or god forbid an incident it shouldn't require the majority of this block coming out. And this is, I'm looking to you, just you're the figurehead, the city manager, but I'm thinking of us collectively. What could we do, be doing better to anticipate these potential things? That's all I have. Do you have anything? Not good. Nothing? Okay. This evening we close with the memorial. Samuel Whitaker Douglas passed away peacefully on October 18, 2017. He was born January 2, 1931, in Paris, Arkansas, to his parents, Margaret Cravens Brooks Douglas and Samuel Douglas. He died in his home in Cota de Casa with his wife, children, and grandchildren surrounding him. In between these two dates was a life lived to the fullest. <clears throat> Samuel Douglas graduated from USC in 1958 and was an active member of Kappa Sigma fraternity. He married Jacqueline Fisher, his sweetheart, after graduation and worked for his folks at the El Segundo Douglas Family Mortuary. 
He later became president and bought five more mortuaries, helping families in the El Segundo, Paramount, Hawthorne, Linwood, and Southgate areas and beyond. In fact, he helped the families all around the world when he was asked to handle arrangements for those that tragically died in 56 different airline accidents. He mourned each loved one as if they were his own with incredible compassion and kindness. He was actively engaged with the community, his friends, and family. He believed in service to others, which included President of the Hawthorne Community Hospital, Chairman of the Robert F. Kennedy Medical Center Foundation, President of the Los Angeles County Funeral Directors Association, Chairman of the 20th Century Roundtable, President of El Segundo Kiwanis Club, and the President of the South Bay Trojan Club. He was a founding member of the El Segundo First National Bank, now Citizens Business Bank, served on the board of directors of El Segundo Education Foundation, and was even the El Segundo Little League Baseball Commissioner. He was appointed to the Los Angeles Mayor's Emergency Committee. He served on the board of the Sentinel Valley YMCA and was also a member of the Round Table of Orange County, El Segundo Chamber of Commerce, Ferrari Owners Club, and the Southwest region of the Ferrari Club of America. 51 years ago, he co-founded one of El Segundo's most beloved, beloved tra traditions, the Mayor's Good Friday Breakfast. Sam went on annual fishing trips to Mexico with his brothers from Kappa Sigma. He took his family on many fishing trips on his beloved boat. He loved to fish and duck hunt. He golfed with his fraternity brothers every week up until he passed. He snow skied. He raced cars, including his own three Ferraris. Fun traditions were something very important to Sam, which included the Long Beach Grand Prix, where he attended every year since its inception in 1973. The biggest tradition he held was for USC football. He attended every home game with his entire family as it grew to three generations. He made numerous trips to San Francisco, South Bend, and across the country to see the Trojans play. He hosted the ever-popular Douglas Trojan tailgate party for family and friends in the same location for over 30 years. Perhaps the most cherished tradition was family Christmas Eve dinner after church at either Lowry's and later the Five Crowns with his clan. Sam was married to his wife of 59 years, Jacqueline Fisher Douglas, lovingly known as Jackie. Together they had four children, Heather Douglas Keller, Brooks Douglas, Aaron Douglas King, and Sean Douglas. His children brought him nine grandchildren, Allison, Preston, Chase, Brennan, Cameron, Braden, Paige, and Spencer. He loved and supported each, no matter what their passion. He attended virtually every game, production, ceremony, and event of theirs. Samuel Douglas was a funny, witty, kind, and loving man that positively touched everyone he met. He is loved deeply by his family, who all consider him their hero, and inspiration. And with that, we are closed.